we will make notes of what other information would help the Board of Commissioners to feel informed, to have an informed discussion or decision on this topic, and we'll take those as homework. <coughs> and then we've also posted there a parking lot for questions. You might have things that come up for you um, during the presentation, just use those sticky notes and a marker, or um, save them on your own paper uh, for when we have the question and answer discussion times. And we will attempt to address all questions while we're here in the room. Um, and we may need to take some for homework as well. So that's the kind of nuts and bolts and mechanics. Here's our agenda. The goal of the meeting today is share information about the detention facility from all of those different aspects that we talked about and support this board and your discussion about options for moving forward. You'll see this slide up here throughout the presentation with a little indicator of where we are. So we'll begin with an overview from um, our Sheriff Van Dalken um, on the current facility, including population management, what are those operational components, what does it take to run the center, what do we have in our uh, operation now from a financial, from a personnel perspective, um, and presenters include the Sheriff as well as other members of this team, but I think you'll introduce the next time. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Just that works. Uh, thank you guys for being here today. I appreciate all the commissioners being here today, Commissioner Newman. Uh, so we talked about doing this, and when we originally talked about doing this and presenting for jail, I had talked with the county manager and talked with Rachel, and we kind of thought it would be really unfair to run this massive amount of information up there where a lot of discussion needs to be had during the commission. So I asked her if it would be okay if we broke out and had a, a work day because we're really going to get in the weeds with this today. Um, I really want to thank Rachel. She, she's had the job of uh, kind of hurting me and keeping me focused and on task and, and working with all these other folks as well as Lee Creighton who has done a tremendous amount of work. So. When we start with some of these predictions and, and looking and doing some, some long-range prediction on things, uh, Lee Creighton has, has been the person who has been able to, to dive into the data and really show us where we are and what's going on and best projections going forward. Uh, Y'all have a really big decision. You've got tons of big decisions, but this is a really big one. Uh, it's one of those decisions that's going to impact you now. Uh, it's going to impact your sheriff's office. It's going to possibly impact federal courts and, and where the, the, the federal courts intertwine with us. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to affect you budget-wise for several years out. And the decision that this commission makes is really going to choose a strategy that is going to send you in one, one direction or the other. One, what I want you to know is your sheriff we're going to bring you what we think is probably the best plan going forward and going to support that for you, but we're basically going to give you three different directions we see that the commission can go with how you're going to handle inmate population in the future. This slide is a good one because it gives you some idea of how long some of these things have been taking place, such as uh, uh, jail-based diversion case management which as you see there first started in 2005 and that predates me. So there's been a lot of forward thinking in Buckham County and the folks who uh, run the jail, who run programming and do those things that you can see has been going on for well over a decade. Uh, so let's go back, 1990 uh, is when we began housing federal inmates. And just to explain really quickly with that, federal inmates are housed in our jail awaiting trial at the federal courthouse here. Uh, it, it is the most logistically sound place for the feds, for the marshals to be able to hold prisoners and get them to trial in a timely fashion here at the federal courthouse in Monday County. Um, Pre-trial services were established in 1996. Main jail and annex opened in 1998. Uh, drug court was first established in 2000. We could probably get you some, Amy may speak to that later. We had state funding for that at the time and things going on and all that ended up drying up. Buckley County is one of the few places that we continue to support drug court. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about MA commissary here in just a few minutes. Some of those 
things such as drug testing for drug court, uh were paid for out of inmate commissary. That's one of the things that was used for that, with that fund. Uh, 2002 to 2003, average daily population exceeds bed space. Uh, during that period of time, I believe Buncombe County received an overcrowding letter to where we were able to double bunk for a while, which is not a good situation. We we'll talked about that as, as we move forward. Um, in 2008, our central or the new jail, as it's sometimes referred to, opened. And I'll give you numbers on those in just a second. In 2012, uh, we started doing the state misdemeanor confinement program which means that people who are sentenced to 180 days to what now? Any misdemeanor, regarding. Any misdemeanor regarding that can be housed in the jail. And they don't have to be the folks who are, who are sentenced in our county. We could take the state misdemeanor confinements from other places. $40 a day is uh, what a, uh, a detention center gets reimbursed for state misdemeanor confinement. 2016, we expanded our federal holdings to the East Tennessee federal inmates. Uh, how many of those do we hold right now, Lieutenant Wheeler? 35. 35 where we're standing currently. We had some bed space at the time that was open. I think Commissioner Fryer had some conversations around that. We had some empty bed spaces, which uh, our, our federal rate was an opportunity to make some money to house some inmates in East Tennessee. Now, here's kind of the situation with the feds. The reason why we're asking us, East Tennessee sounds like a long trip, but their next option if we stop holding inmates for them is Virginia. And just because there's jails around for federal inmates does not mean they can be housed there. There are very few facilities around, especially in Western North Carolina, that basically meet the grade, meet the federal standard that can house a federal inmate. We are one of those facilities. 2017, pre-trial population on the rise since 2012, population nears capacity later uh, than previously projected. I think Lee's going to talk about that when he gets up. Prevention and diversion efforts continue and expand. Crisis intervention was one of the things, and Mother Cornwell, who's passed away, it's hard to talk about that without mentioning her, who was one of the drivers. She worked at AB Tech. But it was basically getting law enforcement and all the systems involved, from mission to AB Tech to uh, mental health and to, to look at the consumers of mental health services, to where if they went out and they committed a minor crime, that really didn't produce a victim. When they were in meltdown mode, we tried to engage with them and divert them and, and avoid the criminal justice piece altogether. Uh, at that point in time, we saw uh, the development and the coming online of Neil Dobbins for the, the uh, crisis beds. And uh, we really were kind of ahead of our victims. It's commonly referred to as the Memphis model. We sent folks to Memphis to learn how that worked how we could interact with uh, with folks that had mental health issues and not make our officers less safe and bring about a better outcome for those who were suffering from the disease. Current facility, main jail, holds 240 individuals, less booking, less transfer, and less medical beds. Now, I think Commissioner Fryer asked a while back, were there some extra spaces and there some extra we will get into that as we move through. Uh, we have got uh, transfer beds and, and medical, the transfer space and medical beds that we have and, and basically segregation sales, I guess, for lack of a, a better term, that, that come into the mix of how we handle our inmate population. The annex is a dormitory setting. It's, uh, I think that is probably the oldest building, even though it's been worked on. It's in the bottom of the all court. Am I saying that right, Andy? Bottom of the all court building. Been worked on, and uh, it actually, in a dormitory setting, will hold 80 individuals. Central or the central tower, which is the last facility we built, holds up to 284. So what that gives us is 604 beds, uh, in 13 housing units. We can hold 508 male inmates as it stands in 11 units and 96 in two housing units. 
Nice picture of central booking there. That's what it looks like. Let's talk about jail operations. When you look at the total jail budget to pay the folks, which is a total of 172, come to work, salary and benefits, uh, a little over 12 million. Operating budget, a little over 3 million. So the total budget for the jail is 15.7, which is uh, not quite half of the $36 million budget that we have. Right there, if you want to take a quick look, I won't go down through and read about how the numbers are broken up between detention officers, admin support, classification, transportation, and kitchen. <laughs> Infrastructure. We prepare our meals on site. One of the things that we've had a little bit of discussion around that if the course you go is to expand. There's some ways to do possibly some savings around meals and, and doing contract. We do laundry on site. I think we have one full-time person that, that works with several uh, inmates to prepare to do the laundry. The laundry is set up as well as the kitchen for a capacity of 356 inmates. So as you can see, we're kind of running on duty, so to speak. Uh, to be able to get those things done. So any kind of expansion that's going to call for different plans around meals and expanding the laundry in some way. Uh, our medical, we contract to provide uh, on-call uh, physicians. We contract with Southeast, which we have nurses in the facility. Uh, correctional medical group serves all inmates with medical and basic dental care and operates dedicated medical beds. So we basically have a medical side of the jail to where we have beds that are specifically for that. How many zero gravity cells do we have? Just one. Just one. That's a cell if we have somebody that would come in and we test positive for TB, which we have had a few times in the past, or any other airborne communicable disease that you would have to put them in a, in a isolation medical way to take care of them not spread throughout the detention center. Infrastructure. A lot of questions about this. So I'm not going to let Rachel melt down on me here. I know y'all probably got questions. Make sure that you write them down because you know the, the whole point today for doing it this way instead of coming in a commissioner's meeting is for the opportunity for complete understanding as much as you can take in this massive amount of information. And don't think I'm saying that we understand all this and we're trying to, every time that we've met with this group, I think we've all learned and, uh, and digging into that and looking at what's going on. So it's a lot to take in. Commissary, the services are provided by Kimmel's. Uh, or Kimball's, the one full-time person we have working in commissary is paid out of commissary. Uh, our full-time PREA coordinator, which some of that's getting ready to change up, and that's a different discussion, but full-time PREA coordinator and our full-time commissary person are both paid for out of inmate welfare. Inmate welfare is made up out of food, the small radios they get to watch the TV, uh, the snack packs that are delivered daily that we talk about. What are some of the other things? Personal hygiene, items, personal items, hygiene. underwear, and socks. Those are all things that the state says that if you're not willing to provide free for the inmate, that you must have a commissary to provide. So basically, what the statute says, which is very general, if you don't provide those things for free, you have to have a commissary where they can buy. Um, phone services, uh, service provided by combined public communications, inmates pay 16 cents per minute for long distance or local calls. Uh, the legislature got involved a while back with this, some of those rates from the, uh, from the providers got a little bit high and they got in and they set some limits on what you can charge for, what they can charge for phone calls. Uh, visitation. All visitation is video visitation. Inmates receive one visitation session that's 15 minutes long per week. Additional visitations may be purchased. 
That's also the chemicals that provides that. The revenue from all three of these things go into what we commonly refer to as the commissary fund, inmate commissary fund. Sometimes you hear it called, referred to as inmate welfare fund. Um, North Carolina, we have always followed kind of the rules around some states that really tightly stipulate what you can spend that money for, where they say that it has to directly relate back to the inmate. North Carolina really doesn't do that. What they say is the money has to be audited through county government. They, they, they're pretty specific about the audit trail that has to take place for the money. But what the money's spent on is a little bit more open-ended uh, in North Carolina. At some point in time, I want to present, I want to make sure that we get through today, but uh, we've got a plan for what to do with those funds that I think uh, if you look at it big picture from prevention and intervention and treatment or programming uh, from an inmate's from an inmate's perspective, I want to present you with a program a little later on that will address everything from the prevention end to the treatment. End. So we'll talk about that a little more later. Also, let me come back up to make sure the state has certain stipulations on what an inmate's fed. Three meals a day, too hot, one can be cold, they have to meet a certain caloric standard. There are certain things that the state says that you must provide an inmate. So when we talk about commissary, we're talking about things outside those mainstays that they're already getting. <clears throat> On-site programming. 30 volunteer programs using over 150 volunteers provide benefits to the inmate population. You can see there, we've got everything from NA to AA to yoga. Uh, you're going to hear more from that in, in just a little bit uh, from Amy Griffin, our partner from RHJ. What I will tell you is we, we've got to the point to where we almost are program heavy. So one of the plans in going forward is to really start doing some evaluation on these programs to where we're not spending less time, we're doing less but we're putting more time and resources into the program that shows return on investments. Some of the things that we'll be looking at to measure that is recidivism or returning to the facility and also inmate on inmate assaults and inmate on detention officer assaults within the facility. Those are all very clear cut measures of how well that person while they're in there, how, how much that program is impacting both while they're in the facility and when they get out. We also have mental health and substance abuse case managers. Like I say, we did, I, I didn't start that. That started back in 2005 when we really started trying to handhold into services when people were coming out of the detention center. What you'll hear are stories a lot of times that when these folks come out of the detention center, for many of them, it's the first time they've kind of been clean and off, off the substances they were abusing. And we have always felt that that's a really good opportunity to make that handoff to providers in the community so hopefully they will continue that. Because what happens usually for that individual is they get out of jail and they go right back to the same environment that landed them where they were. So we're trying to do everything we can do. You've heard me use the term, change the trajectory of people who pass through our detention center. We're doing everything we can do with our partners to change that trajectory. Population management, uh, safely housing and managing the jail population. We will talk about staffing levels, types, classification, PREA, accreditation, and risk management. Where do I hand this thing off, Scott? Well, you're doing good. <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm here with you now. <coughs> Is this the issue you decide going for the correct or just go? I just I can job. add a couple and then uh, it'll go to the show. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Scott Allen. I'm one of the chief deputies with the sheriff's office in charge of managing the, the uh, detention facility and the courts bureau. When I transferred over, I was told, well, all you got to do is manage our staff personnel and then manage inmate population. And I had no clue that inmate population was going to be a task that we would have to take on daily. daily. Uh, in regards to inmate population, diversion 
and recidivism are the two things that affect it probably the most. Um, and for us, with, with that, on our programming is what we use toward recidivism. Um, I think we're second to none in that. I'm very proud in saying that. Um, we do a lot of programs that are kind of out of the box thinking because one of the things that we look at is if we can keep you from coming back to the facility, it helps us control the inmate population. Um, when I was came on and somebody said, you're going to be an inmate advocate, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be an inmate advocate. I believe some people need to be in jail and that. And I'll tell you truly, I'm an inmate advocate, advocate for we need to get some of these people that don't believe belong in jail out. Uh, and we do a tremendous job of it. Um, we have a full-time programs coordinator position open that we are advertising because it is that critical in what we do with our inmate population. We have two chaplains from ABCCM uh, that are employed there. We use them. We have three RHA staff members that are in our facility full-time uh, helping us go through those. So we do a tremendous job of tweaking it. Um, and that we're trying to make sure every day that we manage that population. But some days we get at the end where we go, oh, I hope one more person doesn't walk through that door. So. Good afternoon. I'm Lieutenant Wilhelm. Uh, I've been with the detention facility for 14 years now, just about really close. So you have to put up with me for many more years, hopefully, to come. I don't plan on going anywhere. Um, but I just wanted to speak a little bit about the facility. Um, I've been very fortunate that I started in the jail. I've, I've been just about in any position you can be there, except for where these two gentlemen sit, maybe some of that. Um, so my job, in a nutshell, is looking at the staffing levels. I try to keep our staffing levels up and our inmate population down which that's a full-time job in itself. Um, so the sheriff spoke about our staffing levels uh, a moment ago. So we have 140 detention staff and those detention officers are the ones that are working the floors, they're interacting with inmates, they're booking inmates in, they're running movement, um, you name it. We have five administrators or and assistant administrators in the facility. That's the chief, the captain, and there's three admin lieutenants. Um, I'm included in that group. Then, uh, some of the numbers he showed you earlier, we have, for example, five kitchen officers. And part of our proposal going forward, if, if this new facility is, is built, and I have the numbers that I can show you later, is outsourcing uh, our kitchen services because we can actually reduce the number of officers we have to have. Because um, we do use inmate labor. Um, and where that's beneficial for the inmates, the inmates actually like it. They like getting out of their cell and going and and having a job and working and feeling like they have a purpose. Also, through the state misdemeanor confinement program, we're allowed to give inmates four days off their sentence for every 28 days that they work in the facility. Um, so there's a benefit for them too. They can earn, get earn time. Um, as the sheriff mentioned, we have one laundry officer. Uh, she supervises inmates, and that's what they do is they, they clean and fold laundry 40 hours a week. Uh, it's non-stop. Um, <clears throat> we have two classification officers, and that's the area I want to get into next. What is inmate classification, um, and how does it affect population and, and the jail space you need? Because basically what classification is, how many people have fish, aquariums? Nobody? There we go. <clears throat> okay, how many people have been to a pet store? Okay, so you go in the pet store, you look at the back of the store, and how are the fish divided up? What does it say? Community tank, semi-aggressive, and aggressive, right? You can't put the goldfish with the cichlids or they'll get eaten, right? Okay, same thing with kind of inmate population. It's the same basic concept. We can't put the lions with the lambs and vice versa. Okay, so our job as part of classification, what the state says, is that we have a, a duty to not only protect the citizens of Buncombe County, but to protect those inmates while they're in our care, okay? So I can't have, for example, just, just an easy example, um, if you have a sexual predator, I don't want them around youthful offenders. 
Um, so many different examples of that. So the way it works, when you look at that big number and you say, wow, you have 604 beds in that facility. But on paper it looks great, but they're really not, you can't utilize all 604 of those beds at one time. And here's why. So we have a special management housing unit that only holds those that have had some serious disciplinary problems. So they've assaulted another inmate, they've gotten in fights, they've assaulted staff. So I've got 20, 22 beds designated for that. Do I want all those beds full? No, in a perfect world I want all those beds empty because that shows that um, the inmates are, are being well behaved when we have their disciplinary issues. Um, the step down from that unit is called administrative segregation. So that's a unit that's got 24 beds and that's for those inmates that for whatever reason they can't be put on a general purpose housing unit. So it could be that they have severe mental health issues. Um, it could be that uh, if it was a prior law enforcement officer that got arrested, can't put them in the general population because at that point they're an inmate, we have a duty to protect them. Um, several different reasons we use that. We also use that as a step down unit. So if an inmate did get into a serious disciplinary problem, they were put on special management unit after they do their stint there, before we reintroduce them to a general population, we, we try them out of administrative seg, see how they do, then we kind of introduce them back in the general population. So then we've got all, I told you there's 13 housing units total. We've spoke about two of them. We've got two female units, okay? Those two female units can hold 96 inmates. Um, yesterday we had 88 female inmates. So we only had, only had eight, room for eight more. A uh, week and a half ago, we were over 100. So we were over, already over our, uh, what we can hold female-wise. Then we've got all these other general population units that are for the males. And they're even broken down too. So you have some that are for uh, those inmates who have not had disciplinary problems since being in jail. Their charges are, you know, non-violent. Um, so we're not going to put those with the inmates that um, are in for more serious crimes. We talked a little bit about uh, sex offenders and and trying to keep them away and, and protecting our, our youthful offenders. That leads into PREA. Uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed in 2003 by unanimous vote uh, by the Congress. Both parties agreed on it. Uh, it was finally uh, finalized August 20th, 2012, um, and that put a lot of guidelines into how uh, we monitor the training our officers must have um, in order to keep inmates safe. Because what Priya says is there's a zero tolerance when it comes to any type of sexual harassment um, or sexual assaults from inmate to inmate, from inmate to staff, um, staff to inmate, zero tolerance across the board. Um, so that's why over the years, we've had to do certain things like put more cameras in the building because um, they want zero areas where there's not video surveillance out, you know, except for inside the cells and in private restroom areas and such. Um, so with PREA, we, we also have a PREA coordinator. That's her only job. That's what she does is to make sure that we um, stay in line with, with the federal guidelines. Um, Accreditation, that kind of goes into the PREA as well, um, where we have to be accredited to stay within their guidelines. And last but not least, risk management. Medical is kind of the only area where it's hard for us each year to know what our costs will be. Um, the way the guidelines work within the state, we don't have to, if, if an inmate comes to us and let's say they have a horrible condition, um, a terminal illness. We don't have to be able to fix that illness, but we have to maintain their health at the level they were when they came in. Um, we are very, very fortunate with the group that we work with. Uh, we have the best medical staff I've, I've seen since I've been there. Uh, they do a great job of taking care of these inmates. And it's sad, it, it's super sad to say, but most of the inmates we get that come in, they leave, put on a few pounds, Okay, um, the clothes don't fit as well. We usually have to uh, give them clothes when they leave in a lot of cases because they, they've outgrown what they came in with. They're clean, they're sober, um, 
and, and we get a lot of thank yous. I never thought going into being a detention officer 14 years ago, because I'll be the first to admit, a lot of our officers that come in and they say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there, I'm going to spend a couple years, and I'm going to go on the road. Right? I want to be a, a patrol deputy. I said the same thing. Um, but I've found that this career is very rewarding because you get to see impact and change in these people's lives on a daily basis. So, thank you. Thank you. Trends and projections. This is the data part of the presentation. Um, my name is Lee Craig and I'm with Performance Management. So I've been able to work with the Sheriff's Office uh, for a couple of years now on, on data projects and such. And I've been uh, assisting in this uh, <coughs> endeavor as we've been looking at where our population trends, what are we be, be looking at in the, in the near future and, and on out. So before I get into the data, what I do want to do is talk a little bit about the population in general just so that you all understand kind of the, the reasons for which people are uh, detained in our facility. It's not just people who are awaiting trial here in uh, Buncombe County, as the sheriff has talked about. Um, we have other types of populations in the facility, but the vast majority, over two-thirds, are folks with a pretrial status. So they are awaiting their court date in uh, the Buncombe County Courthouse. Uh, the next group, that comprises uh, the next largest population are, are, are the federal uh, uh, holdings and the two contracts that the sheriff talked about earlier uh, with Western District of North Carolina as well as the Eastern District of Tennessee. Uh, we did a snapshot analysis of the Western District population uh, back in September just to kind of understand sort of where these folks um, came from. Um, and we found that actually 77% of them had Western North Carolina addresses. 42% of them have Buckland County addresses. So even though they are fed in the federal system, they are from our communities and our surrounding area. Uh, chances are their crimes were committed here as well. It just happens to be handled in federal court, federal jurisdiction. We have two uh, kind of sentence populations as uh, local sentence. These are folks who are serving 90 days or less. We also have the sentence misdemeanor confinement program. Uh, those comprise 8% for local, uh, and then a small sentence misdemeanor confinement, or 3% is our smallest group. And then we have a kind of catch-all other category. Uh, this fluctuates from day to day um, and includes a range of reasons for which people are incarcerated. Uh, things like fugitive warrant, probation violation, uh, housing for other counties. Uh, we also have non-support, uh, people uh, dealing, dealing with that civil issue as well. So again, this is the daily population breakdown for the first six months of 2017. So as we talk about jail population and sort of uh, kind of what we're seeing in terms of trends and projections, I think it's important. And um, I think as we were talking as a group, um, we really began to understand that you know the detention facility is one aspect of a much larger criminal justice system. Uh, for that reason. Um, we wanted to look at what are, what are the feeders. Uh, we've got numerous feeders and people that are uh, kind of uh, bringing folks into, into the facility. We've got local law enforcement to include the sheriff's office as well as all of our municipal <coughs> agencies. We've got state and federal law enforcement agencies that keep the uh, detention facility. We've got the two commun or several community supervision agencies uh, that can look into the facility as well as um, the court system. Uh, for our sentence folks. We also have, as, as we've mentioned, uh, several of the contracts as well. So this, this is important when you think about jail population because jail population is really a function of two things. The number of people that come into your facility and the length of time that they stay. So uh, I'm going to focus here a little bit on the pretrial uh, process because pretrial is over two thirds of our population. Um, and you know, when we have sentence folks or when we have federal folks, there's more of an understanding or control over how long they're going to be with the detention facility. Um, and so, what's less known is when a person is booked into the facility, how long are they going to stay? Um, and so, what I'd like to do is just walk you through this. I apologize for it being a little small, I know, but um, 
this is basically the process the first few days after someone is booked into the detention facility. And the different colors, so the green, blue, and red, represent different criminal justice actors. Um, and then we've kind of highlighted potential places of release. So point of release, point of release, point of release. So what this tells you is after a person is arrested and charged, there's numerous points, very uh, several days after their booking or several hours after their booking in which they could be released. And a lot of that is just dependent upon uh, factors and decisions that are made by different criminal justice actors. So we have um, a booking, a person who goes before a magistrate. This is a point of, of release for some people. And we'll see in a minute, it's actually the vast majority of people are released at this point. Um, for others, there might be a monetary bond that's associated with their booking, or there's a no bond or a hold on their booking and, uh, due to a, a type of offense. And so they're going to be detained pretrial. For those who are detained pretrial, they're going to have a first appearance in uh, district court within by the next business day of their booking. And that's another point in which many people are released um, from custody. For those that are not released, there's other points and throughout as their case processes through the court system in which they could be released. This often takes place at maybe a bond review. One of the things that we've been able to do to help the different agencies um, that are involved in this process help move folks out of the detention facility quicker as we've released several dashboards uh, to the public defender's office as well as the DA and the folks in the detention facility looking at the bookings every day and looking at those secure bonds to see is there anybody that we might give before the court and see if we could have a bond modification to get that person out sooner. So it, it, it is, it takes multiple agencies working together um, to really help us keep the, the length of stay for the pretrial uh, folks uh, as, as, as short as possible. Um, the court process is going to play out for folks um, either through district or superior court based off charge. But at any point in time, if a person has a bond set for them and they can make that bond, they can be released um, from the detention. So um, let's transition now and talk a little bit about our daily population, our average daily population. I've given you uh, several years, almost 10 years of trend data here, and um, this graph is broken into those five populations that we talked about earlier. So the green is pretrial, the blue is federal, yellow is sentence misdemeanor confinement, and then we have local sentence and other at the top there of the bars. So what you see is Particularly for the last several years, we've seen a fairly steady and sharp increase in our average daily population. Um, this is the first six months of 2017, so it's not a complete year. But what you do see, we have experienced a fairly significant jump with the federal uh, population, and that accounts for that additional contract that was taken on at the end of 2016. But if we look at the pretrial population specifically, we see that it has continued to grow uh, since a low point of 2012. Um, what you also see, that blue line there, is the average length of stay in pretrial days for that population. So we've seen actually almost a 50% increase in the length of stay for uh, pretrial folks between 2012 and 2016. When we were looking at this issue, we kind of wanted to understand, well, what group is really kind of utilizing the most number of bed days? Um, and so we took a look at the population and as 2016 releases, and we said, okay, if we break these out into time in detention groups, how many are getting out within 24 hours? And then how many bed days did that group account for? So you can see the vast majority, over 50%, are getting out within 24 hours. So they're getting out either at that magistrate or first appearance point of release. However, they're only accounting for 2% of the bed days that are being utilized. As, we, as time increases, we have fewer people that are staying in for that period of time, yet they account for much more of the actual bed days that are being used. So, you know, when you think about diversion opportunities, 
and you think about where can we get the biggest bang for our buck, you know, any type of booking we might want to divert, absolutely, but the actual bed days, we're not going to have as great of an impact. So that's really important as we think about bed need in the future, okay? And any diversion as, uh, investments we want to make. This is real quick, and I know that I think this PowerPoint um, is, in, is in your packets for you, and this table is also included in a report that's in your packet. Um, but just to give you all a sense of why people are under in the facility, um, I've broken this out by females and males. There's a male chart after this. But this is those same days and detention days in five columns, and you see the top charges <coughs> for each of those groups. So basically the takeaway here is, as we get further out, so and as we get to this 60 days or more, you start to see the seriousness of the charges do increase. And that's really what we would expect. Um, these, uh, this is for males. Um, you can see, you know, fairly low level. Uh, there are, while there are more assaultive crimes uh, for the male population than the female, uh, but lower level tend to be in that 24 hours or less category. And then you start to get things like habitual felony, robbery with dangerous weapon, over in those 60 days or more. So, transitioning now to projections. Um, we wanted to take a look at those descriptors of the populations to understand a little bit better about the drivers. Um, but then we really wanted to understand, well, you know, what are our needs looking like? So our projection methodology, um, if you want to read all the details, you can see a, a report that's included there that takes you through the whole methodology that we use. But the three main components of our projection um, uh, equation are a projected average daily population. And what we did is we looked at six years worth of trend data. We threw some statistical <coughs> methods at it and said, based off of growth, trends that we've seen, what do we anticipate the projection or the population to be in the future? To that, we add in the peaking factor because we want to account for those days where we see spikes in the population. And so that the peaking factor accounts for the variance between the average daily population and the highest population spike that we see. And then, as Lieutenant Wilhelm has talked about, the importance of classification and population management. So we added a classification factor in there as well. We did two models. We did a model that uh, uses a higher peaking and classification factor. It's more aggressive. And so it's going to predict that the detention facility will reach capacity more quickly. And then we have a more moderate projection by using a lower peaking and lower classification level. And that's going to give us basically with a range. We're just going to see a day range, essentially, of when we can start to anticipate to begin to see peaking issues, and then where we'll start to see more chronic peaking. So, the three scenarios, um, the first and most pressing uh, that we took a look at, you know, the jail is a sex segregated space, and so we really have to treat these populations differently um, in understanding bed need. Um, so we wanted to look at the growth of the female population and anticipate what our needs would be there with the 96 beds that we currently have. So, the, as I mentioned, the, the day range that the, the models produced is, is marked here on the graph. And that's kind of, again, the range I want to go to keep in your head. But I'm going to talk you through this slide a little bit. This blue down here, this is our, esti our population estimate. In this model, we have made some assumptions. And the assumption that we made is that we're going to keep in the detention facility five females under Western North Carolina federal contract. Okay? And so that's what this blue overlay on the, the population list. Then you have a bold black line. That's your 96 beds. Your blue line, which kind of runs parallel to your uh, population estimate, is a moderate bed need. That's our, our um, least aggressive model. And then the green is our conservative bed need. And so we're looking for the point of intersections with the green line and the black line and the blue line and the black line to get our range. So what this model said is that we're going to start to experience any peaking issues in June 2016. Now when anybody does projections, you're a little bit nervous about, well, how accurate am I going to be? We missed this by just a couple of months. 
we started to see peaking issues and we actually had to send uh, females out and rehouse them in other facilities um, in the last half of 2016. What we can expect or what we do expect to see is as we get closer to that red dot in November 2020, we're going to be doing that more frequently. After 2020, that's going to become standard practice. It was to hit So after we saw that, we said, okay, okay, well, it looks like there's bed need and it feels very immediate. Um, what happens, what would happen to the male population if there was a capital investment in a female facility and we transitioned all beds over uh, in the current facility to um, be male beds? How far would that get us? Again, the same setup here, so we're really looking at the two dots. Based off these projections, we could start to experience peaking issues in September 2026, with becoming more of a problem as we approach the red dot in June of 2029. Then we said, well, what if nothing is done? What if the facility stays as it is? Uh, what would that mean? Um, and so with this, we're making the assumption that we would, the, the sheriff's office would begin to reduce the number of federal holdings um, that the detention facility accommodated, and we would have 508 beds to work with. Um, based off of that, we see that the date range is June 2024, um, as we begin to experience the problems to having more chronic issues as we approach December 2026. So those were the three scenarios that we ran. Uh, just a couple of caveats for us to all keep in mind. You know, we're not controlling for any sort of factors. We're really basing this projection off of average daily population. We're not controlling for any additional factors because so many of these factors are outside of the control of the county and of the sheriff's office. You know, things like how do other municipalities police their communities? What sort of legislation is coming down from the state that might impact how court system and processes run and that sort of thing? So there's lots of factors uh, that these models do not account for, and so that's definitely something to keep in mind. However, they represent our best estimate based off of the information that we currently have available to us. So um, I look forward to any questions I don't, um, that you all might have, and happy to answer those as it relates to the projections. So what we're going to do is pause here and see what kinds of questions have come in. We were originally thinking we were going to put the question and answer after diversion, but um, what we'll do is look through and kind of address. Julie's been um, running, Julie's the Nicholson, if you don't know, that's the Justice coordinator, grouping questions. We'll kind of look through what, what has come and uh, provide information to clarify on anything we've covered so far, and then get into um, what are we doing from a diversion perspective? Some of the speakers already have covered diversion options, um, those that we have in place and those we might explore, and then um, we'll go into the capital um, facility expansion. So, do we have to do so um, uh, several questions around uh, pretrial. Does pretrial count the federally housed inmates? Um, why is the pretrial population growing so fast? Um, if they're eligible for bond or not, um, how does that, how does financial hardship play into that? Um, and are there strategies for reducing the pretrial population that we have, uh, haven't tried but could consider? Are there any of those pretrial questions that make sense to answer at this pause? And how would you like to handle it? Sure? One of the things around bond, and one of the things that we do, and, and uh, Chief Allen might be best to speak to this, but we go in and we look at folks who have a very low bond, but because they're basically somewhat if not completely indigent, they can't make that bond. And a bondsman, because there's no private large and form, will touch them. So we try to go in and identify those folks and as quickly as they're in custody for a length of time, 24, 36 hours, whatever, uh, the chief will, will identify those folks and, and move that process forward to get them out on day service. So they're not just setting, burning jail space when they could be out and done. The day when we start at 500 or less, and all those folks that fall into that category, we approach either the public defenders or the district attorney's office and say, hey, can, can we work to get this one out? And then we go to a thousand 
dollar bond, and we start at that point of trying to get them out. One of the things I've, I've got to say too that has been very helpful right now, it was Rodney's kind of, I think his brainchild is that he goes through and looks at the pretrial calendar and things that he can dismiss, lower level class misdemeanor type things. He sends us an electronic communication first thing in the morning. I don't know what time he starts. It must be like as soon as the sun comes up. But he averages five people a day since we started that program of getting them out. And it's been a tremendous help. And you, we can't stress that even those five beds a day are tremendous to us at this point, especially if it's females, it is tremendous. And one thing I've been seeing with the first question is why is the pre why are those numbers rising, pre-trial numbers? Um, I think jail diversion is great. Um, we have done more in this county than anybody across the state, I would say, as far as jail diversion. Unfortunately, what we're seeing, especially, in, you know, a lot of it goes back to opioid epidemic and everything else, a lot of the issues, the crimes that we're seeing are non-divertible. They're either serious, serious drug charges or um, crimes against other people, assaults, um, that you just can't divert. Or they're out already in the enemy charge. Or they failed to show up for court, which we've saw that uh, orders for arrest for failures to appear dramatically impacted some of those numbers at the time. We'll cover some more of the pretrial phase when we talk, uh, when, uh, when I talk about the version and then see which of those questions uh, remain. There are a few questions that are about who is in the detention facility. Uh, Lee, I don't know if this is right for you to respond to um, a data related one. Anything that might speak to the jump in 2017 of locally sentenced under 90 days. And so we're looking on the computer. Um, and then drivers related to increase in females, potentially related to the opioid addiction, and then also uh, drugs and alcohol as a driver um, for uh, recidivism, people coming into the facility. So can, can anyone speak to um, those? those drivers that you, that you did hit briefly on in your presentation, women and substance, people impacted by substance use? Well, uh, this will be covered in the report that was handed out to you all. Um, we have seen some increases, particularly around um, H and I felonies, in terms of length of stay. So people are staying with the detention facility longer uh, than we've seen. And uh, you know, to the to the point, there's also been an increase in the number of people coming into the facility. I think we're up six percent bookings this time, uh, same time as we were last year. So um, it's. It is a number of factors, I think, that we're seeing converge. Um, women, obviously, that's a national trend that we're seeing. We're not unique in that way. Um, but we can drill down and get as granular as, as, as we need to to really begin to understand uh, what, spe what specific types of crimes uh, for which people are coming in for. Rachel, can you go back to the slide that shows the folks who occupy the longest days in custody on the top five charges? that we put together for us. Uh, I, I do want to point right there, you go, those two. Uh, the next one going forward. So when you look at folks who are in more than 60 days that are really occupying bed space, when you look at that female population, you see a couple of things there, and, and also in knowing what we know about some of these offenders and some of the things that go hand in hand with a drug addiction, uh, when you see the first degree burglary, burglary, possession of heroin, you go up to the possession with intent to manufacture, sell, and deliver methamphetamine, not so much on the possession with intent to sell and deliver, but you come back 31 to 61 days and see the possessions of meth. As you start to look through that, you see some charges that look like they might be divertible. So that kind of fits into our strategy going forward when we talk about a facility that's designed around female inmates and the programming that, that could be impactful there. There's probably a little bit more to wring out of that towel, maybe, diversion-wise, with some of these folks. Now go to the male slide. As you see, when you go to the male population, which is your largest population, when you look at that more than 60 days, other than civil non-support, which is another conversation we had because a lot of that's dictated through the state. 
when you start looking at those things, robbery with a dangerous weapon, habitual felon, come back 31 to 60 days, assault on a female, uh, you got H&I felonies figuring in there. Not nearly as much room with those things unless something changes legally or uh, philosophically around dealing with civil non-support. Uh, there's really not a lot of room there for a lot of diversion to impact those days in custody. There are a couple of other diversion-related questions that we'll come back to in, in the following presentation related to potential to use alcohol monitoring devices uh, and services that might have previously been available in our community with day reporting center. So I'm going to pause those and ask us to look at a couple questions related to operating the center. Here's one. How much do we get for housing for other counties? That's for the writer of that question. I think that's um, when we provide the housing as opposed to when we have a rehab. $40 either way for state business manager time. With SMCP, um, we get $40 a day. We, we, by law, have to hold all those that are in that program that are from Buncombe County, and, and we hold those, but we, we're not what's called an accepting county anymore. So if Henderson County has somebody sentenced and, and they want to ship them off, we don't hold them to keep our population down. Part of that too was strictly financial. Uh, our current contract for federal roommates, we can make $100 a day. SMCP, we can make $40 a day. Which one do you hold? You know, we are, yes, sir. Well, just a little add to that right quick. How much do we pay to when, uh, say, for some female of Madison County is talking about? It, it depends on that county and what they told us. <laughs> Roughly between 40 to 65 dollars a day is kind of the current rate. Um, the last time we had to send females out, we had to send 20 out. We had to, we had to split them out between three different counties because just like we're facing, female populations on the rise, and nobody around us has that space. Um, so when it comes time to to that we get to that point, and we have to send them off. Even finding the space is super super tough, especially with the smaller counties. They're really struggling. And then you have kind of the same issue that, that the feds have and that you have to transport them. And then you have to go get them and bring them back for court. So the further out you have to go to find those beds, it's that much more logistical issue about transportation and costs associated. Some other operational questions. Why are visits only on video? And why are uh, is there rationale related to the charge for, for additional visits? Uh, I think the one visit per week is state mandated. Uh, is that correct, Josh? I don't want to get one visit. One visit per week is free if you come in. I think it's less than that, state mandated. We give we give one per uh, week for free, so visitors can come to the facility. Um, they come into the main lobby. They sit in front of a screen, and, and they're seeing their loved one um, on that booth there. Uh, on the other end. One of the reasons we went with the video, um, we had people going in all these different areas of the facility and there were several occasions when a fire alarm would go off or an inmate would spring, <coughs> make a break spring for head and the alarm would go off and now we're having to worry about not only the inmate population but all these visitors as well and trying to get them out and making sure they're safe. Um, and there were some instances, you know, in our building everything's locked until the fire alarm goes off and then all the fire doors pop Visitors were hitting stairwells that kind of lead to nowhere because at the bottom they're locked. Um, so we just felt video visitation was the route to go. And plus, um, another way that it benefits visitors is if, if I'm from Ohio and my loved one's in jail here, um, I can pay a pretty small fee uh, and, and get visitation time with that person rather than having to travel all the way across the country to see them. Um, the reason we only do one a week for free is because simply space. Um, we have six monitors downstairs that we run. We also have, um, in each unit, there's three monitors that inmates can, can sit on and do visitation at a time. Um, visitation runs in-house Monday through Friday, and on Tuesdays and Thursday nights, they stay open late. Um, so the people who are working, <coughs> coming after work and visit. Um, video visitation runs seven days a week. If, if they're doing it from their house, kind of like a Skype visit, seven days a week, basically from eight in the morning until 10 at night. 
And it allows attorneys full full visit. You know, the attorney can Skype in and visit their client that way. How much do you charge for visit? Uh, they get one free per week, and then after that, I think the. Uh, state systems, of which we do not house here, nor do we have, I was looking back at Pat Freeman, um, limited access to um, in terms of either the system, or the application itself, versus the, the raw data. So we don't have very accurate information with how a case is actually dis disposed of um, for us to really go in and analyze. So what did happen with that actual <coughs> booking? Did it result in conviction, <coughs> dismissal? How long did it take to, for that process to to, to play out. We basically have a release a booking date and a release date. And then if their status changes while they're in the detention facility, so if they're sentenced on that charge and they spend their sentence with the facility, we can we can look at that. But for those that are sent off to state prison, um, that's more of a black hole for us if we're doing right now. So there's no there's nothing um, sorry. It's actually, with our current numbers having the five officers in the kitchen, um, they actually save us, let's see. Um, so currently, our 
when you when you account for food costs and officer salaries, everything out the door costs, we're, uh, we can do it ourselves for a dollar thirty nine cents per meal. Um, if we go with a company called Airmark, um, with our current situation, um, it would cost us a dollar forty six per meal. Um, so based on kind of our average daily population right now, we save just over thirty eight thousand dollars a year by keeping it in house. However, I've got the numbers to show that if we do go off-site, um, Aramark will provide a driver, their own vehicle. Um, we can actually reduce, I mentioned it earlier, from five officers down to three officers, because they would still be using inmates, so we'd still have to have supervision there. Um, but then, because we're reducing the number of officers um, and they're increasing their staff instead, we would actually save money. Um, and I, I've got a full PowerPoint if you got if, if you want me to email that to you later so you can do the call. Yes, sir. Is Airmark the only company doing that? No, sir. That's the first one I've looked at. Oh, okay. You know, I have the question. My uh, concern is that it's busy without. I mean, uh, look at other, you know, nationally, this is a, something that's happening a lot. And I'm sure it's more than one company, and they're very competitive in doing that. And let's see, if we don't do it, let's be competitive when we look at that. We look at more than one. Commissioner, Aramark is a company in this state that's very prevalent in, in food service for inmate services. They have a great track record, and we knew them as somebody that was successfully providing that service in other large facilities. <coughs> so we chose them to give us a ballpark price. If it's something that the county decided to do, we definitely you know, place that out for bid and see what best results were. And I can tell you from being on two university boards, we were dealing with people we thought we knew and they were taking advantage of. Uh, and laundry just was part of that same question, so I would, I would think that so the process would at, be really fine. 356, we know if we expand into another facility, uh, the laundry is going to be looked at and done a different way, and that might be part of John's presentation as far as. I don't know that you have to use secured space necessarily depending on the new facility to, to put in more laundry, to put in more washers and dryers. But in moving forward, we're going to take a little different approach to laundry, and we're certainly looking at doing outsourcing the meals on contract as opposed to doing it all in-house. Because you're going to have to, with the kitchen, you're going to have to provide more kitchen equipment. You can't prepare many more meals than what we're humming with right now uh, if you take on another extra hundred uh, inmates a day, which is 300 meals a day. One more operation and management question before we get back to, to the conversation about who, uh, managing who comes in and how long they stay. Um, what would be required for inmates to have access to being outdoors? Or what kind of legality, what kind of cost would we need to look at? That question in the current building. Discuss what it is, yes. and then we can yes. probably discuss yes. possibilities about it. What, so. what we have now in the current facility, each housing unit has what we call a rec room. Uh, it's an open air, uh, outside. It, it's not outside, but um, you know, it's open to the outside. But because of the way we're downtown, we're built vertically. Um, there is no technical yard, or what we see a lot on on like prison shows. Um, but the inmates are allowed to go out there during their free time hours, get some fresh air. That's where they do all their exercise. And, um, but as far as <coughs> in the current building, I, that would be a you know, correct question, how you would add on to provide outdoor space where we're at on that limited footprint. So dependent to, to research and do some uh, so, but they do go outside on the end of the housing units. There's uh, a rec area that they go outside that is covered on the top, but it's open. It's <coughs> kind of graded and covered, so they are in the open air. And get the get well, depending on what time they go and where the sun set, and they do get some sun some sunshine at times. But uh, and the annex facility has an open roof. The area that they go outside has an open roof. And the people that participate in the laundry and the food, are there those folks that have been convicted already and are serving that or is it people else? Typically we try to use pretrial because we let sentenced inmates go outside the building to work. 
Um, so we let them go out. Um, they do everything from working at the landfill, doing <coughs> odd jobs around the county. Um, so for our pretrial inmates, it kind of cuts down on what they, you know, where they can work. So we keep them in house and, and do the laundry in the uh, kitchen. But they're still building that gain time if they are sentenced under SMCP so that they can get out early for the work that they've done. So if they're kind of innocent, are they compensated for the work they've done? Lots of good questions. Um, I, uh, I'm going to move us on so that we can get to another stopping point and turn the floor entirely back over um, to the chair and to the board. For so I have one real quick before I don't think it, it may have happened when I stepped out. I sure. have a question up there about considering a women's campus, and then I came back in and saw that the, the discussion was separate. I, I picked up that women's campus question and moved it to the corner because that's going to be part of what's coming in the future okay. slides. Right, cool. And I think that um, I think we'll, we'll cover your questions and then see what remains after. Okay. Are you good with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, ready? Diversion. Um, we have been at Diversion for a long time. We saw that timeline um, on the first slide seeing that we've had a drug court um, in operation in Bunker County for 17 years. And um, Amy Griffith, who is the Director of Commercial Services with RHA, that provider has been um, in relationship with Bunker County for a lot of years delivering different forms of diversion. We are a leader in many ways, and Amy um, has participated in a lot of different state and national um, technical assistance in other forms. And can, um, attest to sort of being a front runner. So we've got we've got a, a broad portfolio and there have been we, we can dig into what that looks like together. We'll cover some detail now. Wanted to just kind of frame that we do have a number of diversion strategies which are underway now. So thinking back to February of 2017 when the Board of Commissioners uh, took a look at uh, Justice Resource Coordination we established a newly forming Justice Resource Advisory Council and are working on the establishment of a Justice Resource Center, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which replaces some of those components that went away in our community, which is from when we had a, um, a day reporting center. Um, we've just now uh, been in relationship with the Office of the District Attorney related to um, the Community Access Portal and its, its uh, tools that are available for expedited jail release. Um, the Office of the DA also um, is new, sort of underway at implementing uh, jail specific prosecution. So, uh, an assistant district attorney and victim witness legal assistant dedicated to that population. So, we've got a number of things that are in that pipeline. But as part of this challenge, knowing that we were coming forward with the sheriff to, to have this conversation about uh, the detention facility, wanted to make sure we're turning over all the stones to find out are there opportunities that we can enhance what we're doing. <coughs> Are there things that we've not yet tried? Are there things that we can take to the next level um, to expand our diversion efforts? And so we'll cover some of that briefly for you. Um, the framing before I hand this to Amy is that continuum. This aligns with some of what uh, Lee was covering related to the phases of people's justice, criminal justice involvement. There are pre-booking intervention services, um, like what happens uh, with patrol and law enforcement. Um, pre-arrest, pre-booking, there are diversion services that happen when somebody is in the detention facility, and there are court-based programs as well as finally re-entry, which we didn't include in here um, because re-entry programs tend to be focused on state uh, prison um, and don't have a sort of direct straight line to diversion uh, in the local detention facility. So pre-booking services, I'm going to hand this to Amy. Um, to, to run through a snapshot of what our current portfolio <coughs> looks like, um, and then I will cover some of the, the new options. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to stay on task with overviews of some of the programs that we've off that we're offering now, and a little bit about how they've evolved over the years, because I think that context is important. And I might editorialize a tiny bit, but I'm going to try not to about the contextual nature of this, because I think that that's 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 part of our ongoing conversations. Um, we look at diversion. So let me preface this by saying that you're familiar with the Stepping Up Initiative, right? Many of you probably were on the commissioner's board when that was signed at Bunker County. 
we'll Google it and I'll send some information on to you. But my lane really is focused on diversion of individuals with mental health and substance use disorders. So I just want to preface that. I'm not an expert on crime rates or population growth, but looking at the needs of individuals with mental health and substance use who interface with criminal justice systems, which we know nationally um, is at a higher rate than the average pop, the non-mentally ill population, and they stay longer. So that's kind of why this is so important to this conversation. So we look at pre-booking diversion. That's when the sheriff spoke about CIT. That's a great example of that. How do we interface with a population before they ever even get to the jail and divert from there? And if they have mental health and substance use issues, then that's going to be hopefully to a community-based resource that can meet those needs, right? We can meet them some in the jail, but there's better places for them. Um, there are other pre-booking diversions that have to do more with, you know, um, maybe the types of crimes and non-victim related crimes. But the programs that we focus on a lot here in Buncombe have to do with serving this population, training law enforcement how to interface with people with mental illness effectively so that they can de-escalate them enough to engage them safely in a community-based service. Because we have folks that are not safe. I mean, they do present a risk to the community. Um, and one conversation we had um, recently is that, you know, community-wide, we're constantly evaluating what's working, what's not working, because we can apply the best practice, but if it's not getting us what we need, we got to look at why not. And one, of, this is really relevant to the CIT conversation, because there is a group of people who meet all the like tick marks for being diverted to maybe Neil Dobbins or the hospital because they have acute mental health issues or they're in acute detox, but they're too dangerous to risk them walking away. Uh, potentially, they present a risk to the community or they're completely unwilling to participate in those services or they don't meet the criteria for an involuntary commitment. And so we do more and more lately, in the, over the seven years I've been here, we're seeing more people with higher acuity that pose potential risk that we can involuntary, com, involuntarily commit. And we aren't able to get them admitted to places like Neil Dobbins, or maybe they're stabilized at the hospital, but then they're kind of moved out the door. And the jail becomes, in many ways, the safest, most secure place for them to get that detox, crisis stabilization need met, then we can move on to some of the next stage of what that diversion looks like. So at the end of the day, there are people who end up booked into the jail, and there are reasons for that. Um, so pretrial obviously is intervening with folks when they first come in, trying to figure out who they can recommend for supervision and present that information to the courts. Um, once they're in our system, we have the three case managers the sheriff mentioned that are we have an average ebb and flow every day, 45 to 50 new inmates in, 45 out. That's sort of the roll tide at Buncombe County Detention. So they're hustling, because their job is to try to screen every single person that they haven't met yet um, to figure out what those needs are so they can link them as quickly as possible. And if they have really acute needs, that's when we're working through the court system processes. Um, to figure out how quickly we can get them linked with those needs. Um, on, or we're working with medical in the jail to, or family or community resources who can bring medications in to get them safe and stable so we can put together a good plan. Because like the sheriff said, and the chief said this too, I think, we often are sending people out the door in better shape than they came in. So we want to link them while they're in good shape so that hopefully they'll can you give them our current number on folks percentage wise who come in on psychotropic medication in our jail? Well, the, uh, Lee's going to pull that up, and I'm going to preface that with it isn't always a reliable number because many times they come in because they're not on their meds. So using that, we can look at how many people we're prescribing in the jail. We can look at how many report coming in, but we're probably going to. I bet the number's higher for those who have been recommended for that. Yeah. This is probably an underestimate, but when you look at the people who are coming in uh, and are being screened by our medical um, that I'm just pulling up for the last fiscal year, um, a second, about 33% of those intakes reported being on some side of psychotropic medication. Those are just people who make it to medical, so not everybody makes it to a medical screen. 
So it might be undiagnosed, might, we're not capturing undiagnosed folks and we're not capturing folks who are getting booked out before they reach that medical screen. So again, this is a low estimate. I've seen some of those numbers and estimates are in the low 40s. And that's generally the number I use is like 41%. I think it fluctuates very <laughs> And it has fluctuated. And it's 40% of what the of all inmates that come to the 41 percent psychotropic medication that's not people who are under uh, mental health care of some sort as Amy was saying sometimes we pick those up in the screening sometimes we don't sometimes they will they will tell us sometimes they won't but uh, that number like all of us all the people coming through is that self-disclosed is that what you're only if I choose to, or am able at that point to say I've been on And we're able to work with, so my case managers may be able to, they're kind of like the Scooby-Doo gang. They're sort of out there, like if they recognize that Mr. Belcher maybe needs some support, they're going to be out canvassing, working with BIA, working with family members, working with your community-based providers, really trying to gather all that information. Um, and resources, and then we work very closely with the with the inmates' permission with the medical provider in the facility to kind of bridge those things. So they may not come in with their medications or disclosing, but with a little motivational enhancement and mom dropping by, we may be able to get them back on them at no cost to the sheriff's office before they leave. Um, and they usually leave with a, a, yeah. at least a week to ten days supply of that medication with our urging of. Please seek some care while we're outside of the city. Yeah, that's true. The, the jail does provide those bridge medi medications. So two examples of sort of robust kind of court-based programs that have evolved over time would be the Justice United in Supportive Treatment, the JUST program, which is our jail diversion program for people with serious and persistent mental illness. And then the we have mental health and substance use reentry, but we've developed over the last couple of years we don't have a good name for it, so if you have any suggestions, let me know. Internally, we call it a SAD plan, a substance abuse diversion plan, but it's modeled on the JUST plan in the, in the sense that with input from the defense, uh, from the public defender's office, um, the DA's office, and the bench, and the sheriff's office, how do we produce a really well-crafted product that says concretely, we can divert this person into an inpatient med, usually Swain or ADAC locally, um, for substance use treatment, pre-trial often, sometimes they're sentenced, um, with the court sanction. And generally we recommend, and this input came you know, in consultation with these stakeholders, unsecure for treatment only, <coughs> re-secure upon completion. And if that makes sense, they're more likely to stay and finish because the 42 days at Swain where they have peanut butter sandwiches is more pleasant than being in the detention facility for some folks. And what we saw was even if they're doing it because they just don't want to be in jail those 42 days, by the time they get through the 42 days, they've often gained a lot towards their recovery. So, um, so these court, uh, these are ways that we can work with the court system to, to divert people out. Sometimes they need to come back so they can present in front of the judge happy, healthy, and sober and say, your honor, this is where I am, this is what I've learned, so it can mitigate maybe some of the outcome of their case. Um, but sometimes the attorneys do have the ability to go in and say, hey, my patient, my client's about to wrap up at Swain, can we modify this release and go ahead and just let them go to the long-term residential program they want to go to? So I sort of, not to get in the weeds, but we, we've really looked over the years and bobbed and weaved around these sort of complex systems and how to navigate at these points of intersection where we can um, not only meet the needs of the individuals in the, in our facility, but also hopefully link them in ways that are meaningful enough they won't come back. So, um, again, full, uh, we have court-based programs. All of these are, well, um, adult drug treatment court is a post-plea felony drug treatment court. If you're not familiar with that, it's a national, international model probably now. Mr. Williams can answer questions about that because he's been a big part of that program. But these are folks with substance use disorders who are committing really big felony crimes, usually to support their drug habit. So that's where you see on those slides, the B&Es, the thefts, those kinds of things. When we see someone with charges like that, we say, oh, I bet they're 
abusing drugs and they're doing these things um, to support their <coughs> habit. Um, if, they're, if they're successful in that, they usually avoid going to prison. So it does, it can reduce the amount of time they're in the facility pre-trial, but big picture, it's pulling them out of the criminal justice system entirely, which definitely impacts, impacts us locally. Family Drug Treatment Court is a civil court. Um, so when you saw that slide that Lee put up about the women and the types of charges, and you saw all those civil non-supports, I bet you a dollar all of them have DSS cases. And they're getting non-support payments because they probably aren't, they aren't having, they don't have custody of their children. And I'm not trying to be sexist, but we talk to these women because they also have the heroin charges, the meth charges, theft type charges. So we've got a big, we're serving a lot of people in the detention facility that DSS is also serving. And we work really closely with them to try to collaborate around what the um, fan with the uh, juvenile court judges are ordering for these parents to try to get them able to parent safely and what the court the criminal courts may be wanting as well so the just uh, the, the SOAR court program is a nice way to divert people because more of our parents in DSS care Tammy's not here um, also have criminal stuff so it used to be just sort of like these civil court folks that are having trouble with their, you know, safety parenting, but more and more of them are coming to the table with criminal stuff related to their addiction. Um, sobriety court is the new, one of our newer programs. It's a DWI court program um, that's administered by Judge Keppel. And um, uh, those are post conviction. So you do have to take the conviction. There's a mandatory minimum that they do have to serve with the local confinement facility per state law, right? But the, their prison time can be suspended. And again, big picture, we can hopefully remove them entirely from the criminal justice system. Um, and then the Veterans Court, that's one of our newer programs as well, that is serving specifically veterans. Any questions? We will be coming back to you in the coming uh, weeks to give you more information about the launch of our Justice Resource Center. We're really excited about the work that's happened over the past year to put this in place to create a, essentially a center, a point of access for people who are involved in the criminal justice system to access meaningful services and supports to help them uh, to be more stable and to be more well. There will be diversion options in the center uh, for pretrial defendants uh, with an emphasis on those low-level nonviolent crimes, both a misdemeanor as well as a felony uh, diversion element. And services will also be available to people who are at other life cycle stages of their justice involvement. It's not always a straight line, uh, straight timeline in someone's life when their justice is involved. Sometimes people are involved more than once, but the center and the 15th floor of the courthouse will serve as an access point. Um, this is kicking off uh, next month uh, with a public launch. So we'll get back to you with more information on that. Um, what we want you to know is that we're working hard on strategies for jail relief. So we've been convening teams to, to, to look at these various kinds of strategies. One of the questions that came up on one of these sticky notes was related to alcohol monitoring for individual defendants. That's the fourth bullet down. Um, is, so we pulled together an ad hoc group connected with our Justice Resource um, Strategic Council, but a group that's meeting on a short-term basis to look at this issue at this time. What are the opportunities and what would it take from a system coordination perspective, from a financial perspective, what kind of outcome could we see, who would best be served, and how exactly would it work? Um, could people serve, um, <coughs> people wait in the community for trial? Uh, we're charged with the PWI or under eligible offenses instead of waiting in detention is kind of the question. And so we're hoping to be bringing a proposal forward on what that could look like, as well as many other strategies in this list. So technology related to expedited jail release is one that we have been looking at related to the VA's community access portal and the share spoke with we did that earlier, as well as Chief Allen. Um, gender responsive strategies, so what can we do specific to the female population? Uh, so I think that's where we're feeling the squeeze. Um, we're in communication with a provider um, that's been doing fatherhood and parenting programs for, for a good while. Um, the Gateway Initiative, um, trying to get a contract in place so that we can launch something for mothers who are in the detention facility. The cool idea related to this is that there would be a track of classes 
that's happening in the detention facility with the simultaneous traffic classes that's happening in a community-based setting. We hope that people can be released from detention during the time that they're going to that course and complete that in a community-based setting with the same access to their support system that they're accessing in that program. So that's one example of a strategy that we would look at uh, for females. Civil non-support, looking at people who are in detention for chronic uh, non-payment of child support and failures to appear related to, that, to those payments, what can be done to, um, to lower that number. Uh, solutions to maximize pre-booking diversion drop-off points, so back to that mental health um, uh, and substance use conversation. Are we doing the best job we can with the behavioral health urgent care, that's C3 and 356 and the revenue? Are we uh, coordinating the best we can with the hospital, detox crisis beds, um, so that people um, are in the, right, the setting that's most appropriate for their needs? Um, reviewing processes related to dependents' ability to make bonds, that's been a theme in some of the questions that have come from the board today. Uh, is equitable access for people of all income levels, and so uh, what what areas do we have local influence and control? Uh, universal screening is the second to last bullet on that list. We are looking internally to the detention facility. How can we, as early as possible, identify people, um, and consistently as possible, identify people that have needs that can be um, connected with services that might help them to be more stable and well, but also um, help expedite their release from detention. Um, and finally, uh, local uh, pre-trial screening tool. We've got um, efforts underway to look at the tool that our internally run pre-trial services at Duncan County uses to screen risk, uh, what, what, what options are available to have that validated, to look at other tools that might be used by other communities. We're looking um, at best practices that we can borrow from other communities because what we're seeing a lot of the same uh, a lot of the points that have been made by speakers today are uh, experienced in other communities across the state and across the country so borrowing from that um, we did a question so we're going to continue uh, into some options and impact i'm going to hand this back to the sheriff you can click it forward when you're ready um, framing options talking about the facility and um, then moving into questions. I know we're running a little bit behind. Thank you. John will be presenting in detail today. <coughs> well, I'm just going to run through the, the numbers. And, so, um, and, I, and I'll make it pretty quick. So as we looked at options, uh, we saw some need meet up with opportunity, uh, as Commissioner Belcher was talking about. The idea came up early on about doing just a facility for female, uh, female inmates only which gives us an opportunity when you look at those slides of what are, what are burning up a lot of jail days uh, and you look at that female population, you see opportunities there for diversion to have some impact. Uh, that's one reason why we're investing in, in Ron Gates' program about uh, strengthening mothers and he can take that program from the detention center and has the ability outside to continue it on. He's done the strengthening fathers program and we've had good success with uh, we used to have Ellen and Clark and women at risk, and that ended up going away. But when it did, we saw real impact to really auctions around diverting the, the female inmate population. So one of the options that we're going to propose to you today is looking at building a new trauma-informed, based around uh, programming, and, and being able to work and do that handoff outside for the people female population uh, somewhere in the county. I'm going to let uh, uh, John speak more specifically to that. And we would transfer all female beds from this main campus facility to that facility. We're talking about doing it outside of where it's, it's kind of, for lack of a better term, pod construction, to where you don't have to project years out. You can kind of build as you go. Uh, I don't know if John will cover that, but if we feel like we've been doing, what you have to do is project out, build a big, huge building, which I think was somewhere around $70 million, uh, to build it on city property, and it just doesn't make good economic sense. With going with that pod strategy, you can kind of build it as you need it. 
sort of thing. Once you get the, the security and the infrastructure around, you can add on to that. Hopefully we won't need it, but uh, you're able to do that uh, without having to build another big, huge building. The second option that we can move to is you can choose to delay the capital investment. You can choose to do away with uh, holding federal inmates and move that building on down the road. Um, that's going to buy you, and let me check again with, with Lee, that's going to buy what, 24, 36 months? For the females, yes. For the females. We typically, I think our average daily population for federal females thus, thus far this, this calendar year is seven. Um, so when you think about that number that in our model, buys us again about two to three years. So, what does it do for our male population? Male population, it has a bit more of an impact just because the male population currently right now includes the eastern uh, folks, so that number is larger. So you have more flexibility in terms of how many beds you can free up than actual for the female population. So that's going to buy you some more space and time uh, moving forward. The problem with that is you're going to eliminate a revenue stream that when you go to build, when you eventually do go to build, you're not going to have. Uh, we look at that revenue stream being somewhere because we're getting ready to come up to renegotiate our federal contract. And, and we think that probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about $130 a day will be the reasonable estimate, which could put us somewhere, what, Jerry, six, around $7 million of, of revenue uh, a year from continuing to hold the federal inmates to put towards jail construction at some period of time. Uh, the other thing that you do around getting rid of your federal inmate population, some of that money is already diverted now to our I think that's still the current plan is diverting out of the uh, to the diversion efforts. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So you're cutting off some of the, the revenue to some of the diversion that we're already doing. The third option that you have is to decide that we're never going to build another detention facility. And what we're going to do is we're going to invest in transportation and we're really going to kind of ring the other jails out around in the area as best we can to hold our population as we move forward. And I'll, honestly, I don't know how realistic that is. As you've heard from several of the presenters, female space right now across the state, period, is a premium, is at a premium. And I don't know how long you can do that. You lose your revenue stream, plus you have to uh, basically generate a revenue stream to do if, if state misdemeanor confinement stays where it is, somewhere around $40 a day per inmate. No, go ahead. Uh, Swananoa, where the women's facility is now, used to be a juvenile. Is there any way to work? Or I don't know how many of that place even holds anybody got an idea. Uh, if they could do anything. I, I don't, and I think when you run into some of those problems, Commissioner, is you've got different standards for pretrial for people who are held pretrial and people who are held post conviction for what their standards are with the state. So in other words, there's different standards for somebody that's held pre-trial that has not gone to trial and been uh, uh, found guilty as opposed to somebody who's been found guilty and they're serving a sentence. So there's different different levels of, of standard there. So that is kind of mixing two things that don't necessarily go. Uh, any other questions before we go to questions? I guess we can go to questions, right? Um, there's slides. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Impacts and considerations. Uh, and John's slides, the, the, the capital slides are after that, Chair. Okay. Let me see if we've hit everything here. I think I talked about them when I went through the, the options. Uh, it's a good idea. The, the other problem in dealing with federal inmates, and I don't want to take up too much time, but it is a, it's, that is a very complicated, complex relationship. And what I mean is we all want, we all want inmates who are awaiting trial, whether they're federal or higher inmates, to have access to their attorneys, to have access for family visitation, to do those sort of things. 
So when you move the ability for the feds to hold their inmates here in Buncombe County, you really throw a wrench in the cogs of access to attorneys, family visitation. As you saw, 77% of the folks who we hold uh, for the Western feds or for the, the Western marshals, the federal inmates, uh, have a Western North Carolina address. So I would imagine they would have to be transported probably from Charlotte, Mecklenburg, just guessing, because remember, they're going to have to find a facility that meets the federal standard to be able to hold. So it, it causes a lot of different problems at that system level. East Tennessee inmates, they're going to have to hold, they're going to have to take their folks to uh, uh, Virginia. So in other words, if they lose the contract with us, they're going to have to very rapidly move towards getting a contract with uh, somebody that can hold the inmates in Virginia. So it, it seems like there would be more space in East Tennessee, but I think the jail's running out of space is what caused the problem. There's nobody willing to build this is why well, they came to us. Yeah, uh, I understand that, but Knoxville, it's a bigger area. What, what, what's the jail there? How much capacity? Have any I have no idea. All I can tell you is uh, Toby Deaton is our marshal's representative from East Tennessee, and he said their best option that meets their standard as far as traveling and transportation is going to be Virginia for them. So to get to where Chief Allen was talking about, once we commit that we're not building, they're going to go ahead and get involved in that contract, and we're going to lose those East Tennessee federal inmates without the opportunity of ever getting that contract back. That may be the, the route you guys decide to go. Sure. Uh, just, sir. just for a point of information, when you say Virginia, you know, you could be Abington or you could be... I think Abington is that. News. I, mean, it's, I think Abington is what he said. Okay, so Abington is what he said. So the, the next slides are if if we were to proceed, uh, the clicker's over on the other side of the table. If we, Diane's got it. Okay. Uh, if we were to proceed, what would that look like? Are, are you guys moving? I think it's time for John's presentation now on his, on his figures and his numbers for expansion. And I'm done. Unless you guys got any other questions, we'll move right into talking about what it costs to build a facility like I was referring to. So what I looked at was that um, Wayne County just finished a satellite jail and to, to hop on uh, Commissioner Belcher's idea of saying, okay, let's take the female population and move it off site. What's the cheapest way we could do that? And that's a, basically a <clears throat> modular design construction, slab on grade, one story, and we move it, we move it off site. What we're looking at was two medium of uh, pods being 15 cells double bunked each, and then two dorm like uh, pods, 64 cell or 64 inmates each, and with two segregation cells or timeout cells. What I did do in looking at, at uh, Wayne County was did some modifications in the fact that we anticipate moving uh, the laundry from here to there. So we have a laundry facility there for, for both jails. That we would have, instead of a full-fledged kitchen there, that we would have a warm kitchen there. The sheriff would basically uh, go out and contract with somebody to bring meals in. They would bring it in bulk and then download it into to trays and, and give it to, uh, to the inmates. In looking at that, I made some assumptions that after looking at Wayne County, that they spent uh, 15.75 million uh, on their facility, and I made that I made an assumption that the other four million dollars that we would either have to go out and buy land, or we'd have to go out and take land that we have and develop it. I mean, it's usually around here that we would move a lot of dirt. Facility would have to be near water and sewer, obviously, and it needs to be, it can't be out of county line because that just, transport cost becomes uh, very, very expensive. So in, in, in pretty round numbers, we were looking at $20 million. Now versus if we had to go high rise here, like the, the sheriff said, we're looking close to triple that, simply because once you go up, we're in a downtown setting, we've got some way to connect to our existing jail, and at some point, 
intake and sign port and all the support facilities in that building just get too small to handle <clears throat> what's coming through the front door. And uh, so at some point you got to flip all of that over to another site next door and come in and redesign and upgrade those areas <coughs> to build a whole big kitchen, a new kitchen, new intake. So it becomes very, very expensive. So honestly, this is the least expensive option that, that sits out there that the county could do. And I, I just tend to, to run some numbers that I want. So, you, of course, if you expand, there'll be costs associated with it. And um, in terms of the debt service, this assumes if we borrow $20 million over 20 years, uh, the annual debt service payment would average around $1.42 million per year. Uh, the graphic off to the right shows you the total interest costs over the whole 20 year life would be $8.4 million. Um, in addition, uh, we would need another transport vehicle, so that would be in our capital fund account. Uh, if, if we assume a four year replacement cycle, it would be just under $15,000 a year to keep that vehicle uh, being replaced. Um, What's not on here, because it would be 10 and 20 years out, is, is major capital maintenance. If you have a new building, you would be looking you know, 10 years for maybe new HVAC, 20 years for a roof, et cetera. Um, so the remaining costs, I'll turn it over to Terry Powers. She'll talk about what the departmental budget would be. Yeah, these numbers were pretty preliminary, but I think they're accurate. And, and in, in the ballpark of what it would cost for a new 109 and um, we we projected it would take nine officers per shift because it's a 24-hour operation. We would have four shifts, so that's 36 detention officers to staff the facility. Um, I think we would require initially any additional supervisory staff, the current staff, we would place some folks out there and be able to absorb that responsibility. Um, we took our current operating budget and projected that out for another 190 uh, folks, and that's where you got the $1,537,000 operating cost on an annual basis. Um, that's meals, medical, what it costs for supplies, and, and what have you to operate the facility. Uh, the salary benefits was for the 38 officers, that was 36 per shift, and for all the shift detention officers, one transportation officer and one additional classification officer. And that's about it. The bottom number um, was a projection and what we felt we could realize in at least the short term over the next five to ten years per year for housing federal inmates. The, current, the, the county currently um, we, we receive in federal housing dollars a little over $3 million a year. We house um, 90 to 100 federal inmates at any given time. That's around 30 for our uh, East Tennessee folks and remaining being our, our Western uh, federal inmates. So it's, it's, if you have excess capacity, we would feel like it's financially responsible to try and fill that those beds with federal inmates. One of the things to consider when, when you're looking at um, offsetting some of that with federal inmate housing dollars is the liability is a little bit less, or the big wild card with inmates are medical costs. State law says that we have to, as they mentioned earlier, maintain an inmate in, in the in same health they came in at. If they have a heart attack while they're in the facility, or if they fall and break an arm, or, something that that's the county's responsibility for those and so sometimes those medical costs are really not within our control and that and can be quite costly. Uh, if it's a federal inmate or a statewide misdemeanor confinement inmate that we're housing under those contracts, all those medical costs fall to the federal government or the state. So the county's not responsible for that part. We can tell you pretty close what it costs us to clothe and feed and um, and watch over an inmate, but the, the big wild card is the medical, medical cost, so we're not responsible for that with the federal dollar, with the federal contracts. Can I ask a question about the um, uh, revenue offset? So we're making, uh, or there's about $3 million in revenue currently 
Um, so this this revenue outcome projection is seven point six. So what is the what's the assumption on how many federal inmates that would be? So that's not seven point six million on top of the three million. That would be and if you that'd be the total if this new facility were here. So what's what's the assumption on how many federal inmates there would be to Renegotiating federal contracts, and Sherry can speak to what she did, but you're going to have some more available bed space for a while with the with the opening the female facility. Now, the one thing that you can't do, and I, I need to throw that out there, is you cannot use state dollars to build a facility just to hold federal inmates. That's a that's a violation of law, so you can't do that. But what what you do when you open up those 190 beds for females and you create another 100 beds on the main campus, uh, it gives you some opportunity to hold a few more federal inmates and hopefully we'll renegotiate that contract for somewhere in the ballpark of $130 to $150 a day, probably $130 more. Probably. Yeah, there's a precedent in the state, Mecklenburg recently renegotiated their federal contract for over $150 a day. Um, we but we made the assumptions in, in that projection that we could initially house an additional 50 inmates. The federal uh, marshal services confirmed they'd be happy to provide us with 50 additional federal inmates if we could take them. Um, so we, we feel like that's a sound number. So if you take the 100 that we currently house, add another 50 to it, that's 150 inmates a day. Multiply that by 135 to $150 a day, depending on what we were able to negotiate when our contract was used in uh, January of 2019, then 365 days in a year, and you get you know, 27.3 and 7.7 .7 million dollars. So, pretty, pretty simply, you're, you're estimating enough of an increase in income and revenue to cover the departmental annual cost. Yes, sir. Basically, the, the increase in cost, yes, sir. Basically, you're covering the 2.4 or 0.5. You know. So the cost, true cost, would be the cost of the bill. To the well, that includes That's payment of the debt service. The 1.4 million um, is the first number. Right. The debt service on a new transportation vehicle is at 14. Then, if you add to that the salary and benefits for the additional staff and the operating costs, that's where you get that 5 million 342. Right. What I'm saying is that the, the additional four million dollars that you go to over the three that you're projecting. Right. It's not a hope. You're projecting that. Uh, would that did four million? What I'm saying would would cover the, the departmental cost in the middle columns. So yes. the co direct cost of the county projected would be the cost of the building. That's uh, all. Eighty five ish. Right? Am I thinking right? Yeah. So here's really kind of the kicker. So if we decide tomorrow, and we had if you guys decide tomorrow, we're going around building a new facility. You decide you're going to build off all sites and the stars and the planets all lined up and John Creek is able to lock that in. We're probably 24 months out before you put the first individual in that facility. If you build on campus over here, you can add an additional year of permitting from the city before you can ever break ground. So you're already, if we decided today, which I know we're not there, but if you decided today you're 24 to 36 months out before you have anything operation. Eventually, you're going to have to go off site. Uh, I had the opportunity to work at Spartanburg, I, to work in Spartanburg when I went to the Sheriff's Office before I went to the Justice Academy. I worked there for three months. I think they had seven, seven different facilities that they transported inmates from to get them back and forth to court. And uh, that's where kind of the idea dropped. <coughs> the old thinking about having to project 10 years out and build a facility big enough to meet your needs with those costs, uh, what we will tell you is the further you go out in the projection, the less accurate the projections get. So it's really a very costly move, and, and you can't always say what you're going to need in six or seven years. So, so one, one thing, just on these, these uh, numbers, this is, really helpful. I've been kind of, this is a 
lot of what I was hoping to, to learn more about today. So for going from about 100 federal inmates to maybe double that under this scenario, um, I mean, we have about 100 now, so basically um, we're getting another 100 more, and out of the total 200, you get $7.6 million. But for the additional 100, it's really half that. So I mean, in a way, the net increase is, is, is like half of that $7.6 million. So, what we're so, doing right now. so I just, I don't feel like it's, I mean, if you just look at it just purely here, it sounds like, oh, this actually just finances itself, but we're already going to get half of that if we manage a way to keep the population at the current number. So it's really a net increase of like 3.8 billion of the revenue. Plus what you're getting, you're using the offset, your current offer, your current offset, which I think was the condition of energy. No, that, was, that was not, you're, not, you're right, you, there's only 3.8 increase, but what I was saying is that if you're able to get that 3.8 increase, that covers the uh, maybe I lost something here, but what has the 3.8 been used for in the past of our hundred and many federal inmates? It goes back to general fund, and it's been used for a number of things. It goes through and it goes through the budgeting process, just like uh, any other money coming into the general fund. The county manager and commissioners will decide how that money's appropriated and where it goes. So, how much of it would? go into this new pod system here. I that would be completely up to y'all. I think in a general sense it's all offset. All the used to offset jail costs or else you'd be replacing it with other general funds. So you know it takes that total amount to run the current jail plus the additional operating funds. So are there any so, so are there any other, so are the federal prisoners, um, do they have any additional costs that we're currently not being paid for for that transportation? There, there are additional costs that we do get and reimbursed for around transportation. Uh, they're not big dollar costs like the, the housing costs, but there are costs that we recoup for transportation. How, how do they pay? Is it
you know, I think everywhere in the nation you're seeing communities say, please feel free to jump in here, but you see people of lesser economic ability remain in jail longer because they can't even meet very small bonds. So they start looking at how do we release people based on their risk to re offend or. So as we think about that on a system level, Dr. Creighton's slide that sort of mapped out that pathway, that, that's either at the magistrate's level or the first appearance or the second appearance? But, I mean, is that the level of the system where? Well, and um, it would where? even change who you recommended for mm -hmm. ES pretrial and how the, the bench would evaluate who's appropriate for pretrial. And when you look at our overall population, we have um, a fairly limited number of current people on electronic, am I correct if you want to talk about this number scale of It's not, we get them, do you But they have 20, they're, they're 20. I mean, so there are yeah. other investments related to some of those companies. And our intent would be that that visit to Mecklenburg um, is a, much as we did with Durham, involves the public defender's office, the DA's uh, office, the bench, and any commissioners who are interested in going to the So we're one of the more successful um, innovations in the nation. Mm -hmm. Oh, please go. Yeah. And, um, so in Mecklenburg County, I think with the Health and Funding from the Market Foundation, they devised this new risk assessment that is working really well. I think it started out working with the judges. I think the plan was to expand it at the magistrate level as well, and then they've already done that. I don't believe we currently have the risk assessment at the magistrate level yet, right. correct? Yeah. And it's based on very objective criteria that's applied to everyone. Mm -hmm. You don't even actually have to interview the individual because it's just an objective criteria. I mean, that's very compelling. I mean, we heard recently that there are people who are ending up, who are spending time in jail who, even if they pled guilty to what they're charged with, would never end up in jail. And that seemed to speak to some opportunities to sort of revise what's happening at the magistrate's level. It doesn't, you know, just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it can't compute that someone would end up in jail who would never serve time in jail if they were convicted of being guilty. So anyway, that's a bit of a sidebar, but it's right there. One of the things that complicates that, and Commissioner, you're exactly right, a lot of these decisions are made at the judicial level. Really, truthfully, who stays and how long is completely not a law enforcement function. Uh, you know, we go out and we arrest, we do, but even at that basic level for who, uh, whether or not they're able to be charged at a, a defined probable cause and then whether or not what kind of bond they get, that's the base level judicial magistrate function. Uh, one of the things that we found that keeps coming up when we look through the data is as far as people getting out with charges and sometimes it looks skewed, a lot of times that's the history of the individual showing back up for court. And, and as I mentioned that earlier, the, the orders for arrest because they fail to show up. And if you've got an individual that's failed to show up for court two or three times, even if it's a minor charge, they'll, they'll leave them with us. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I don't know how you, that, that'll take a bigger effort and, and all parties involved to figure out how to work around that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think the, uh, you know, the tons of great information here, I mean, the kind of, uh, Looking backwards data and then the forecast for future and capacity, that's that's really helpful. Part of what is kind of hard to evaluate what, which of these different scenarios seems to be the best course is you know, when um, you know, Rachel, you lay out all the different, you know, here's seven or eight different bullet points of different ideas for how to further work on diversion and population management. Just, you know, to what extent do we know right now or can we can we forecast, you know, how much impact they would have? Right, so, so we've got some really specific metrics on kind of projected growth just based on kind of what we're doing now, but if we, if we do all these things, I mean, how much, how much can we move the numbers? This is a real mixed bag. We've been asking ourselves those questions as we gather. So like, can uh, the continuous alcohol monitoring, we went in and looked at some data. Do you remember having any of that handy? I don't have it off the top of my head, but you know, I think, What's, what's true is that this community has been investing in diversion for a long time. We've got a lot of great programs. I think we're coming to a point, like a lot of jurisdictions are, similar to Mecklenburg, if we're going to continue to kind of, you know, 
get as many people out as possible that you know really don't need to be there, we do have to start looking at a more systemic level of how our criminal justice system operates as a whole. Um, you know, that's where we're really probably going to start to look at actually moving numbers that are going to make an impact in terms of long-term bed. That's what I was thinking. We look at the civil support, how many are in the current any given day, 10 or 12, and how many of the strategies that we've come up with, could, how many bed, jail bed days could we save two or three with this initiative, two or three with this initiative. The bigger system reforms, um, like uh, looking at an evidence-based pretrial tool, um, take big system efforts uh, to make happen, and those are the ones that have the potential to yield. So usually more at the state level, really, than the county, would that be accurate as far as the changes in the buying from AOC and the things you need, uh, statute, legislatively, I think, a lot of those changes, and I could, I'm just trying well, to... From the, from the Justice Council, one quick point, met last week, we uh, pitched the idea, I think some commissioners have discussed it among yourselves as well, about can we, can we do like you did the Memphis trip, can we get a road trip together to go, um, Look at Mecklenburg um, and learn from them and see what might be translated into what we can do here. Yeah. Um, this is the right time to do this. Can I just make an observation of the impact that building a jail on site for the female inmate population, the child population, that would have an impact on the public defender's office. And I think it would have an impact on the DA's office and the court system as a whole. And that right now, if I have clients over in custody, for bond hearing, I just walk right in, right, right over to the jail. Very quick, talk to that client, come back over, very quickly do that bond hearing. You, those clients then get moved off site to somewhere else, it's going to add more time to that. It's not going to have as easy access to those clients to prepare their situations currently when you can go talk to the district attorney. They can say, well, if your client would do this, we will do the probation, you can just walk over to the jail. Tell the client that you can run them forward right from there. I would suspect that there may be an increase in your average length of stay for the female population. If you move the female population off site, and I'll have the same easy access to my male clients, but my access to my female clients. I understand that. Thank you, Mary. In, in the situation of the federal prisons, I do remember that I did come to you because a uh, federal judge, like the federal judge here, asked me if y'all could hold 20 more prisoners, basically, uh, federal prisoners. And I asked you know, y'all to see if you could, and you did. And what that basically did, basically just like you're talking about there, is what he said, the attorneys that were here, I had to go to Cherokee to talk to the people. They, they turned the clock on when they left here. Went over and talked for 15 minutes, and when they got back, they turned the clock off. So it was cheaper to, to bring 20 more prisoners here. So you picked up on that, and that's exactly what I was thinking. The, the hardship that Ms. Melvin's talking about uh, is just kind of, uh, you know, it's just kind of magnified in the federal system. So when you quit holding federal inmates and they move out, you're talking about slowing down that process of coming into in court and increasing the cost. And and I get what Leanne's saying, and I, I agree, but then we got to get down to the point where the only other option to keep from doing that is the $70 million options, and the quickest you can get there, if we do it today, is 36 months, which kind of puts us out past the projection, especially on female inmates. I'm on the East Tennessee, because he was talking, you know, he's a federal court judge here, and he went to closer to in East Tennessee, and the court system is there. Do the attorneys have to come from East Tennessee to here to see the, the inmates? Yes, that's what's happening. Well, and we have, so they're going through the same thing that he was going through. They're, they're paying the tab from there to here and then back for the measure. Uh, the feds have set up a their own video visitation monitor. Uh, it's in one of the cells. That's all we use it for. And they actually uh, will do visits from East Tennessee via video um, for that purpose, so they don't have to make the trip. So, so their attorneys can 
and, and that about. would be an option too for, for just locally. We can put a video on. visitation in, um, as well as video arrangement that we're already doing um, in the phone. Matt, 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 So we're going to throw one more thing out real quick on that same vein that Leanne's talking about. And she's right. I mean, every, you know, every time you move in distance, you're creating hardships with the turnings and process. But think about if you don't build and you go to housing them all out of county, now instead of going two miles down the road or three miles or whatever it ends up being, they may be driving to Cherokee, Haywood, Jackson, and wherever the space is available. So that trip is still going to happen with those folks. It's just going to be out of county now instead of somewhere down the road. I don't know if we can explore what other places have done instead of going around the county. Um, but I So we, we probably have some things in state. As Commissioner Frost said, there's probably some things out of state where they're doing right. some things drastically different, and we can take a look and see if that's we have that option. That's how we're talking about it, yeah. yeah. All right, let's, yeah. Well, just Rachel, in, in responding to Commissioner Frost's question, can we um, segment that by uh, sort of um, component of the criminal justice system? So can we look specifically at what strategies exist at the judiciary level? What strategies exist at the level of the DA's office? What strategies exist at the level of jail? And then um, I, I would find that kind of segmentation very, very helpful so we can have focused conversations with the entities about what they see as possible. We'll try to provide as much context as we can, like looking at how the state, some things are available to us um, locally, and, and some things require state action. And the sheriff's department has given the hands of Do um, we know the DA? acting as aggressively as possible um, to look at these things. I mean, that's, you know, just exploring everything. I mean, they're dealing with the things that can handle themselves. They're not responsible for being able to look pretty well. So if we can explore everything. Yeah, that's it. All right. Uh, any, any last information requests or next steps people want to identify for now? Uh, this has been a terrific discussion. Well, we appreciate y'all. Another discussion we've had session we've, I think we've ever had, just in terms of this is just very meaningful information in the different scenarios. Uh, I think the, the different ideas of how how it might be go are uh, a lot clearer what those pathways are. And I think we all agree. You know, this is the last thing we want to spend more sure. money on. So I think we're gonna 
want to aggressively explore all options, get more data on that, and then and, and, and talk further with everyone who's involved in the process about how to work together on it. So thank you, thank you everyone for being here today. Let's take a uh, ten minute break and we'll come back. Process is something that I've had the opportunity to help with in about in various settings, uh, both in the Service Foundation board meetings and the general um, commissioner meetings over the years. Um, part of my role as staff, of the, um, as staff with the county is overseeing this grant process, uh, which I have done for the past four years. The work of community development grants is guided by the resolutions. These are posted uh, for members of the media on the on your web page for today's meeting, and you have a handout in front of you. Um, there it was an original funding resolution um, that was from 2008 that was modified in 2013, um, setting the framework for what this process looks like. Um, in sum, this is a process um, through which nonprofit organizations can. Uh, be granted funding for their work from both the county. Um, those grants um, are awarded through a contentious annual process and through annual performance contracts. We'll dig into some of the nuts and bolts, the details of how that works. Um, and then other clauses related to that funding that are included here, like nonprofit insurances, those, those financial disclosures that they provide to the county about their organizations limitations on capital investments, etc. So those are the basis that funding happens. And, and here's the process. Um, it's a cycle, and where we are is right before it starts for the next year. So the very top happens in November. We typically go out to community organizations and let them know the application uh, process is opening for the next year. Our practice has been to notify those who, um, those organizations that receive funding the prior year that the process is open. We set up a website with a, uh, and a certain link and send that out to people where they can get information and keep uh, posted about the process. Those applications open in November and they submit applications to the county in December. And they do that through um, an online application. It's called here on the slide WNC County Grant Approach. Um, we are not the only organization in Western North Carolina that is serving as a grant maker. So we have together with other organizations that um, do similar uh, processes where organizations apply and are granted funding. United Way, Community Foundation, Cherokee Preservation uh, Foundation, and did two things, looked at the menu of questions that we ask organizations, so we're asking, we're asking them similar things, we're using similar language to ease the burden on those organizations. So like the agency description, those kinds of questions. And we use the same kind of software. So it's our own software, we have our own license and our own access, but if somebody um, is, is with a nonprofit organization in Bumpton County, they will encounter the same kind of online application interface, the Bumpton County process as they would for other grant programs. So that's the kind of common grant approach that people apply to for the uh, nonprofit community development grant funding. Those applications come in uh, between January and June. Staff pulls that information together for the Board of Commissioners. So each year that looks a little bit different. What do we want to see about it? Um, we provide analysis and compilation of those applications. Um, present that information to members of the, to the Board of Commissioners. Another piece of information that helps shape that those investments, which are made by the Board, is the oral presentation that happened in the spring. So organizations come in. Uh, this has been in place at least for the past three years, but then brought it back. Anyway, um, organizations come in. You remember this meeting because it's a long one. Um, in three minutes each to quickly come up to the uh, microphone and share about their program. Five minutes if they are upon for more than one project. Um, and then ultimately, grants are awarded and made official uh, when the county budget is adopted in June for a July start. We use uh, performance uh, based contracts. Um, so the mechanism 
through which organizations receive their funding is a contract that lists the time frame, the scope, or the, the activities that they'll complete, that they're agreeing to complete as part of the work. Those activities are written, um, that contract language comes out of their application or out of their previous year contract. Uh, they agree to uh, provide us updates on how the work is doing through measurements that they report back to us. And throughout the year, typically on a quarterly schedule, throughout the year they submit updates to the county and we compile that into a roll-up report, which you have a printed out copy of at your place. We send this to the Board of Commissioners quarterly and it's also uh, made available to the public on that same cycle. Uh, so the roll-up snapshot of Mine looks crazy on the uh, table of contents, so I'll have to check that document if yours printed like that too, so like that. Um, as those come in, staff provides some kind of technical assistance and support. Um, I see your I see your volume. Is it where you thought it would be by now? Are there considerations? They might talk to us about the program being seasonal, or they might talk to us about factors that have changed in the community or for the organization. So we take that with them throughout the year and then provide these uh, reports for the work. In a nutshell, that is the process through its cycle. Funding priorities are currently based on the sustainability plan. Um, the sustainability plan uh, you saw and approved in February, maybe? Is that second February? Um, for the for the new year, this is the uh, strategic plan for Bunker County um, that comes out of uh, John's office and, and planning put this together um, to set priorities for what we want to see in the community in the areas of community environment and economy. And the decision has been over the past few years to align those investments and grant dollars with those. Uh, strategic goals and objectives. So an organization, if they're applying for funding from the county, would map in their application, here's where my work fits, that we're doing pollution or waste prevention, for example, under the environment category, and that's where our application coming under. And then when we do the performance reporting back to the board, we do it under those same categories. They're pretty broad. I haven't really found a program that's not been able to, to find themselves a, a fit within those work categories. So, a question. Please. When, uh, when we're looking at these, is it, uh, you know, I've heard my feelings said this is a crazy idea. Can we have, can we have these colors beside them if they hit three orange dots and two green dots and three blue dots? Mm -hmm. um, and when they do the application, you know, because like I said, you know, can, can justify when the organizations uh, align yeah. with more than one goal for the roll-up reporting we generally kind of pick the one that they most leading fit with now people can self-select in their application process where they think they fit and then sometimes at the staff level i'll move them to another category because i think oh well if we're going to put one community center here we should put them all three you know all community centers similarly is that what you're asking no it's not okay. what, I'm, what i'm saying is that somebody applies yeah I'm not familiar with them. You are just said, well, I'll go over here and I'll say with that there. There's sure. more over here. Yeah. But if they get five of these, you know, it's five color dots, you know, I kind of, I mean, for me, that would help me. You have some kind of visual well, you can have display. Legend, you, can have legend on, you can have a legend on the list. You yeah. know, they have five lists instead of just being spreadsheet. You know, you could have, you could tell us that, you know, on the sustainability plan, they get, you know, You'll see the dots. Eventually, I'll get used. To, might get used to what they. That's a great suggestion, and we'll make Might get used to what those are. The other thing is, is that um, you know, you said that we go out and we we send to those that were last year. We solicit them again. Um, this may or may not be true. We may be, you know, continuing to get some. Maybe reminding some people to apply that maybe shouldn't be applying because it's a grant and the money is available. Maybe reminding them we may be missing people that can do the job better. I think there are pros and cons to that approach. I think uh, one rationale that I heard previously was that that limits us since we don't have a growing 
uh, amount of funds each year to, to give that's limited, limiting and not widely uh, broadcasting the invitation to apply limits to the number of applications that come in. But like I said, if there, there are parts of the approach. What I didn't say at the beginning of the conversation is because we're at the start of the cycle for the next year, anything that we want to do to either tweak the process or shift the process uh, more significantly, now is a, the time to do it. So it's um, not a crazy idea, and that's why we're here to invite that kind of conversation. I, and you know, to echo what Joe was saying, um, some, you know, sometimes when I look at where our priorities are, um, and you know, there's, you know, one group for every year that's $6,000. I think it's year after year, it'd be interesting to go back and see, you know, when they didn't get $6,000. So I agree with Joe about, um, you know, it's just part of a habit, um, you know, nothing against sending on the green, but every single year, $6,000, you know, at their point, and you were, you know, with priorities, this board seemed to share, it's the green thing, or the housing. Bluegrass is pretty cool. But my, my point is, every single one, you know? Yeah. So I've already written down four ideas that came out in that conversation about ways that we uh, options for for adjusting the process in the future in future cycles. Well, I put application by category, share information about how to apply differently, and maybe that's open. <laughs> And close to, to different kind of applications, I'm not sure that could go either way. Limit the number of years a project could be funded. Is that what you were saying? No, potential no I, I would never want to. Um, yeah. But, it's, you know, I can hear what Joe was saying. Just report on it and um, be aware of it. Yeah. Um, you know, because some places, um, you know, they use dollars too much for new programs, you know, like the YRW. <coughs> Yeah. And I, I don't really have a problem, you know, limiting the amount to a certain percentage, you know, of you know, the budget or a certain dollar amount, you know, because you can always make exceptions to anything, but I don't have a problem with, with people competing is not the right word, but applying for a certain amount, you know, of available funds in a grant. Because this goes up every year. It seems, well, it seems to the amount the amount does. I don't know that the number of asks go up, do they? Do the number of asks go up? They go up and down. Um, they do? there will be some so bigger bigger yeah. ask yeah. projects that kind of throw off a trend. Right. I've got some trends and some uh, current portfolio information that I'll uh, share with you in one second. I think to that point, though, um, we, we are not always clear from a staff perspective on how some things can move from a contract within a department to community development and back to community development. And sometimes that drives your ask up. And if it's sad, it's the first year. Well, that was very confusing. Last year. Last year, last year really oh, confusing. Good. It's confusing about yeah. us. That was so before we get there, here are the considerations that we've made note of over the years that we that, that I as the voice for the, the the funding program communicate to partners when they ask um, how do how do I get funded? How do we pick what projects get funded? It's a commissioner driven uh, process in alignment with the uh, strategic priorities of the county. Um, alignment with those priority needs in the sustainability plan is, is important. Uh, alignment and support of core services. That connection to department level service contracts, that's not something that we've really found our stride on, and it's been bumpy, and we're to probably clarify that. Um, how strong a written application is, which is not everything. Um, 
current performance of an agency or a project if they've been a group that's received funding before, the community impact and outcomes, both previous and uh, projected. Are they using evidence-based practices? Are they uh, client-centered with their services? And by that, we mean trauma-informed, uh, depending on what kind of field. This is, as you see the portfolio, uh, uh, yeah. funding mechanism that holds a great variety of different kinds of projects. Um, so not all of these are buy cases. cases. Uh, Nonprofit financial assurances, how much are they requesting versus what's available, uh, to Mr. Uh, Belcher's point. Uh, and then also, how do we have flexibility for our um, So here's a snapshot of our current portfolio for this year. Um, what, 1.2 million in 36 grants with a range of 4,500, so 4,500 up to 175,000. Here's how they split out dollar-wise between community, economy, and environment. Uh, economy has the largest uh, financial investment. Environment smallest. And we break those down into in this case, uh, for, for simplicity's sake, the one that they most closely associate with as an objective with the users. So this is the 1.2, so that doesn't include the HHS contract, which is about an equal amount, right? Right, so when you look at this over a trend, um, it's very noticeable from FY16 to FY17, and that is the year that a number of contracts were removed from the competitive community development process and placed into the uh, community contracts category within the budget. To speak to that, something that's tricky is that community contracts um, are in support of department work but don't sit within department budgets. And so during the planning process for the FY18 budget, those projects that had been legacy grants and then made into contracts were presented to commissioners to weigh in on for budgeting purposes, where at the same time departmental level managers were also looking at that, and that's when something that created confusion. What's in the competitive process? So you would never do uh, <coughs> uh, budget twice for it. Budgeting in one place, but looking at it, um, not being aligned in, and coordinated in how we were doing our budgeting. I think it was already budgeted in the part, and I'm glad it's dedicated to the consideration. So you were seeing it too close. The kinds of things that we're looking for in the process. Uh, we have Can you go back to slide? Yeah. Sorry. So the average is not really relevant there. Average too many a year. Because in 16, there was probably those contracts in 16. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we gotta, we got to separate those and have a clearer understanding of them. Because, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't be confused with it. But, but, you know, I mean, yeah. the changes are not really that yeah. big. I mean, a lot of stuff just got reclassified, right? <laughs> if, if, if you stack what we've done, Stay on that. Stay on that slide. I just wanted to note that the number one item that we wrote down as we listened to uh, ways that the process might uh, need to improve in going into the next cycle. We've heard this from our providers who felt really confused about uh, whether or not they needed to um, speak to the county and who at the county about their uh, funding. We heard it from. Charged to weigh in on and decide about ones. We heard from my experience as staff, not knowing kind of who to compile and where to provide information for the best decision making. Um, an option for handling that contracts versus grants confusion is to move true contracts, those that are <coughs> as contracts, into departmental budgets and not have them into in a category called community yeah, contracts. Right. Because right. it's hard to. I mean, I can explain with, with confidence the difference between a community contract and a community development contract. Well, and also, um, 
Well, one, how we did it last time was terrible. I mean, that wasn't any of our fault, but it was bad for everybody involved. And it's true, keeping with the departments um, was much more sense. I think a great example of a transition from your last session is I don't think that either the Sheriff's Department or Health and Human Services would have ever recommended eliminating women's lists. But it got looked at in competition. And so nobody was making a link to the city commissioners. If you reduce this, you're going to see it impact your jail population. You know, if, it, if it sat in jail diversion or jail population or the Sheriff's Department, somebody would be making a link. Sure, you can reduce it, but it's going to impact. A way to explain the difference between a contract and a grant, um, the contract being um, something that the department would purchase um, to meet their core service needs, um, that without, without that service being available, they, they would purchase it. So, um, they would provide. If you couldn't purchase it, you'd still have to provide. Purchase or provide. Uh, so, sitting in that might be a contract related to the health and human services function that, that could be rolled in under the health and human services budget and be under the discretion of the department director uh, and, and that right. team as opposed to the and to the county or budget section. So, to me, a contract within a budget would be that you would decide to contract for those services with that community partner because they can provide the services and the outcome cheaper or more and more effective than you can. If not, then within the department budget, we should hire the people to perform that service if we need it. We don't hand out a contract just because we've done it for 10 years, but because these are the right people for the MAB. You know, we're able to pull that into the department, and then the departments are the ones that are accountable for that. That's consistent. Is that right? That's consistent with our understanding and, and standard practice all throughout departments in the county. There are purchasing processes and bidding processes and contracting. Um, do you want to speak at all to the, to the contract kind of process? There's Contracts aren't confusing as far as how they handle within departments. We have standard structures for doing that, and it exactly describes what we are referring to. The confusing ones are those ones that are straddling between contracts and grants. Well, it, it's like basically legal. We waste a contract with them and certain things. That basically saves us money overall, and they do typically the same thing. That's, that's, that's the only thing, and I'm I'm looking at it. If it's a, a saving county money, we get the same process out of it. That's what we Well, like actually, you made it that And that review is done within the departments, not necessarily here. So I, don't, I don't remember anybody coming back to me not and saying, you know, this, this didn't, this, well, we we'll probably have, but this, this one's not working out. And, You've dealt with them around budget increase because we're purchasing a service that like, you know, is um, responsible for ensuring in the community, but um, no, you've not the right the department's dealt with the onboard management. And you know, the flip of that is there probably have been grants moved to departments that departments didn't understand why they got moved to them for contracts. So it's a cleaning up of what, if y'all decide you want to delineate that, there's cleaning up of what? Like some of that, like family justice or why that was under their department. But all of this, these are your decision. We'll manage it however you all decide. But that's one we've heard from more than one commissioner. I'm thinking about what's the way we contract, the way we've done it. The second one. Um, before we before we leave the first one, I mean, just I think um, it's good to discuss it. I think there's in some cases it's always going to be a bit of a question mark around how to categorize some of this stuff because there's plenty of things that are very worthy things that departments could certainly. I'm glad that they support them and recommend them and want to want to do them, but they're also 
you know, they're also discretionary, they're optional, they're not required by law, they're just probably really good ideas, right? And I mean, in some ways, it's the, the, the same ways you would describe the things that are kind of in the community grants funding. They're not, we're probably not required to do many of them. It's just the community wants to see these things happening, so we support them. So to me, it's always going to, I think there's always going to be a little bit of a, a little bit of a gray area in terms of what logically just ought to come out of a staff department and what you know the commission might might review. So to me, the most the most important thing is um, you know maybe we have a process where the things that we generally think are community you know kind of go through process, and then the other stuff is, is originating from the departments. But even if we don't kind of um, give those projects the same, put them through the same process of um, review that we do everything else, I think just disclosure and awareness is is important. So I mean, if anybody has a question, we can get information about it. Um, so I wouldn't, if we're just, my point would be, the stuff that's going through the departments, I wouldn't want to lose sight of them. There's a lot of good stuff there and, and have the ability to people get information and, and ask questions. So uh, I was kind of thinking that, uh, you know, the same, same thing too. Can you, you know, the budgeting process, the budgeting time, does it, does it make sense to have those, those contracts that we're doing? And somewhere during the budget report or whatever, these are the contracts that we're doing and they're you know, performing very well. And these are the contracts we're funding within the departments this year. And these are the community development units that we're funding. It's just not on the same sheet that we're trying to review. And that disclosure. That there's clarity on that. That disclosure says it, you know. Would there be opportunity to build out a, a RFP process on the contracts? Or does that become too cumbersome? I think some of them do go out for RFP, but um, if, if you think about, a, I'll put my department head hat, you know, you're going to see the budget after the department's pretty much done their budgets. Right. And then, so say you said to HHS, I think you ought to go out to bid on primary care. You can't switch 17,000 patients from one primary care. For, you know what I'm saying at that point in the history? Right, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I wasn't suggesting that so much as that thinking of this from the sort of access and clarity perspective that if an agent, if, if a department says we have a core mandated service we have to provide and we want and we, we can't provide it in house and we want to go to our manager for it, that there would be some mechanism through which, as opposed to applying for a community grant, an agency could apply for a community or could. Submit a bid on a contract. Now that's accurate the way it's currently done. So it's currently done that way for these contracts. Any service that okay. we're not required to provide by law, then departments are required, or that the law says you have to insure it but not be the direct provider, okay. the department has to go out to a bid process. So that's already happened before <coughs> like okay. services we contracted for in 18. Those were all done via. Okay. North Carolina does not require. For services, right. so our purchasing uh, statutes that we operate within, um, we go above and beyond to do request okay. proposals and competitive processes. So it's not every contract every year. Okay. Sometimes, okay. Um, we, like the child support enforcement, <coughs> that might have been in a three to five year cycle, and that's really right. at the discretion okay. um, of the experts there in those departments running. Those programs to figure out what's the right cycle for each one. Gotcha. That's a practice that we've done a lot of. Yeah. The request for proposals or RFPs. Yeah. And then we would anticipate um, who goes in the room. Okay, so that's how the contracts come in order. Yes. Okay, great. That's how. But to Commissioner Voucher's point, we would be more transparent about that the budget process. Yes. Yeah. Whether it sits in the car boots or not. Uh, more if, on the theme of transparency, and this was already brought up, sharing more information with, with the public about how to apply. As um, I had the chance to be a part of uh, funding processes for requests for proposals, for our Isaac Coleman grants, for, uh, for tipping point grants, I found myself working with uh, less traditional or institutional uh, organizations throughout the community um, that said we had no idea how does this work. We, we weren't aware of the opportunity to apply. 
Um, and so there's an opportunity, to, uh, there's room to grow with um, more complete information that has been accessed in this process. Uh, three. There's been some discussion about are there uh, projects in that mix when we look at our current portfolio that are square pens? Are there things that sit in there that seem more like an economic development investment or seem more like a capital or maintenance investment? Um, I think that that's an open question. That each, each cycle we look for ways to, to, to best align those investments. Are there comments or thoughts on that? A couple of those that come to mind for me is um, like why am I who would say we believe you made a funding commitment to us historically in a different way than going to a competitive process every year. Or PAC, who says there was a maintenance agreement that was that the county had long term with us, but we're thrown in that competitive process. Would those be two examples we've recently heard from? Yes. Where they feel like their funding was an agreement made historically between them and the county. And, and, um, and they're confused by the process. So, so specifically, like, should we consider some long-term, mm -hmm. longer-term agreements with certain organizations that we think realistically, you know, we're going to want to support long-term, not to say you're maybe legally obligated, but that there's a working understanding that that's the intention of the commission. And, Somebody else says differently. That's going to be a yeah. Um, what staff brings forward is they think that they can be a part of long term. That's what I look at. Um, a more sweeping and less incremental change would be to adjust priorities within the investment instead of saying fit within the sustainability plan, fit within a priority area such as affordable housing or such as early childhood education. I mean, I think, I don't know how anybody else feels, but I think if we set priorities, um, we could make a bigger impact, for instance, in freaking classrooms um, and kind of drift and drag. strategy as a way to leverage resources around the core needs, the core needs. Um, Maybe in an initial, if we were to phase in something like this, maybe there would be a way to keep the general category open as well for a year, you know, so that, um, but that the focus of funding would be aligned with, um, with the core policy priorities. Which I think those are two of them. There might be others that we would that, that would be added to that list. I'm really interested to hear what I think about that approach. I wouldn't want to leave out. You know, there's a lot of ones that we've been good. You know, we have partnerships, and they do a really good job, and they're not better you know, where our priorities are right now. You know, we're going to have to shift our priorities from time to time. So that's going to be a living document for a living you know, and moving. That's going to move. But I, but I think we can seek them out, you know, and that there will be times like now, you know, when we, uh, you know, we are looking on the pre K, we are looking at affordable housing, that we're going to want to let, let people know that. I mean, people are going to need to know right. that. You know, so when we let them know that, then, then maybe something will come up that will be able to help us or someone will step forward that might be able to help with those priorities. To summarize what I think I hear you saying is not limit applications to certain priorities, but communicate certain priorities uh, to those in the application. That's, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good summary of what I said, whether everybody else wants to. <laughs> so I'm just trying to make sure. That's a very good summary of what I said. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
I just wonder as the board, when you looked at, and I don't want Reggie to go back because we know we're way over, but when you look, or getting there, when you looked at those priorities within the sustainability plan, whether you feel like you own those or there's something we just bring you every year and you see the update and we say, yeah, that's our plan. I mean, are they still reflective of what y'all would consider um, priorities? And I don't know that, and I'm not asking you to answer it. I think that's one of the questions. Um, how long has it been since we really looked at what fueled those pies up for your priorities? And I think we, it, it would have been helpful in the past to have one of these sessions on the sustainability plan. Uh, sustainability plan typically gets published and put on the commissioner's desk, and then we read it when we get a chance. Yeah. And that's just, it's a pretty, pretty intensive document, you know, and a lot of work, a lot of work going back was done before any of the, any of the commissioners that here got here, you know, and, you know, we were exposed to it, and, you know, we go through it and review some of it from time to time, but, you know, an exercise, I guess, at some point in time. You know, I think we get in here to the grants and the contracts, and when we look at priorities, I think of grants. And we need to be more specific and to get prioritized based on what our emphasis is, pre-K or whatever. And then a lot of these that we've been giving to year in and year out, should they be contract? You know, should we look at that? Uh, because I think we need to use grants to be specific when you look at community of what we are trying to make an impact on now where it's pre-K, affordable housing, or whatever. But that's where I think we might be getting, you know, we rub up against grants and, and uh, contracts. We need to be more specific in how we do it. I hope I was clear. Yeah. Do you all know how that <clears throat> grant amount compares to, like, how much the Community Foundation gives out on how much missions the foundation has? Like, how the county ranks as a local funder. I imagine we're in the yeah, top three somewhere. It's not, it's not a lot when you look at the overall budget. That, that would that's, be interesting to see. So well, that's a great, I mean, I think, that's good. I think you're right, we're at the top, but we ought to pull that one. Well, we absolutely are. That's a good one. If you have the HHS and that together, it's Probably, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that, what it speaks to, I think, is probably, is the, is the, just like, you know, what you said, Alan, it's just there's, if, if those, or if at least more of those dollars were focused, the opportunity that could exist to try to move the needle on some of these areas. We'll pull that. That's a good one. Yeah, has gone through the oops, 
performance reports and cross-referenced end of year performance with funding decisions for the next cycle. And it isn't it does not show that we're always uh, that we always adhere to that uh, suggestion within the funding resolution. Um, ways to get at an adjustment on that might be a, a penalty, if you will, or you could flip it into an incentive um, related to performance, time performance to money uh, within a current cycle. Um, or, and or shifting time frames. The report that you have in front of you um, is a year-end <coughs> report for FY17 that came out 30, within 30 days of the close of that fiscal year, so you had it in July, but budget was adopted in June. And so there's a, um, there's a little bit of a syncopation between the cycle for the annual budget and the cycle for the funding. Uh, it doesn't always put you in the position of having all information available when decisions are made. There's also a timing issue, Rachel, just in terms of groups applying for funding in December when the decisions are not going to be made for you know almost six months later. I mean, it's almost like yeah. I mean, have you already yeah. done, have you already done that by the time we make our decision? <laughs> we hear from partners or, or, or change your mind that it was a good idea. Partners will comply with whatever process and cycle we put in place because we're the funder and they're the applicant, and we're very accommodating and, and yeah, willing to participate. Yeah. But we do hear that that's hard for organizations at this time of year to make their grant application for some, and not here until the third week of June. Seems really early to me. Yeah, especially because percentage-wise, there's such a small part of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we don't need it that early. We no. think yeah. agencies talk about grant writing time. Jasmine, your director, we think relate to this like yeah. February-ish. Um, that's a lot, there's a big push there. A lot of deadlines yeah. hit for funding that starts that fiscal year. But yeah. also our notification, not only is our application pretty early, our notification is pretty late. Yeah. And so right. there have been times uh, to get this year where I was notifying uh, organizations post July 1 about funding to the effective July 1. And that's that funding. But at Brown's point, I mean, it's always the same every year. So why is it I wonder also if we did it, you know, a little bit, a little bit closer. Well, we did the applications a little bit closer. I mean, maybe there's a way to do. You know, we're kind of getting towards the end of our fiscal year, so we can kind of do it. You know, we, we funded that group last year. We're kind of getting closer to that year, so we can sort of have a really fresh sense of like how to, how to go. Maybe we're really not quite done with your year yet, but we're getting in that time period where the evaluation would be kind of close to the decision point. We've got right. trends. I mean, nine months worth of data by the time the decisions are made to show up in their time. This is my sound. I feel like it's a chart. We're basically spending the same amount of money. I think, maybe I'm wrong, we settled the budget. Just like that, right? But these two would be up if we had other stuff tied to them. We set a budget for an amount of 2.5 million. And part of that money that you're talking about is take out already. Then we have X amount of dollars to work with for the rest of the funding. That makes a little more sense to me. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier, Mike. That, you know, okay. set, okay. a, set, a set amount. Uh, set, a, set amount. Mike, well, I'm just saying that you know, I'm agreeing with that. To, that, that might, it's not a bad way to look at a look at a budget, you know, that have people submit for that particular fund. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that within the departments that you know we're not going to be working on the priorities of the group, that we're not committed to those priorities. You know, we just got a certain amount of money that we put out for you know, for bids for the period. But but like last year, I don't know why we weren't having to do that. Yeah, it should be. No, it shouldn't. It's a separate presentation. Yeah. 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 Are those uh, rapid fire in person presentations helpful? What? Probably. I think they're helpful. I would suggest doing them every other year instead of every year. This is my personal take on it. Um, a lot of, the, I mean, a lot of the groups, you know, I mean, if we are doing long term stuff, 
And especially after there's an election, you know, new commissioners of work, I feel like people should at least kind of get introduced to a lot of these groups that are among the common, commonly funded recipients. But doing it every year, that second year kind of seems like not as great of a use of time for me personally. <laughs> well, you know, I'd like to give some input here because I've been on the asking side and the giving side now. But I don't like the way we do it. We waste a lot of, not, it's not efficient. We waste a lot of time. We bring all these people before us to give us three minutes. Couldn't we find a better way to do that? Get a committee, committees maybe made up of a couple of commissioners or somebody to really look at it, to bring the decision to us where we can make the final decision. But why put the people through you know, that three-minute session that lasts for, what, six or seven hours? It, it, to me, it, it looks like that we are doing that just for window dressing to get votes. Organizations spend a lot of time preparing for those. Yeah, they yeah, do for, for, for what? They're very anxious if they're not chosen to be. They read more than you all intend of, am I chosen to present or not? Right. They stress about, does that mean I'm out? Does that mean I'm in? When you are, that's not. We assume y'all's intent, but they're very stressed by that. It was not clear in the most basic cycle the rationale for. What if we do it different though? Change. I mean, to have them the same. The city doesn't. Do it. We we had a we had a committee when I was in the city council, and it didn't mean that it was less work. It was right. more work. It was probably more work. For the people who were the who were the committee, I think they took it. You know, yeah, they spent a lot more time on it. And I think yeah. that, you know, I don't think that made any organizations work if any less either. I think they gave them more time and yeah. So for some people you're kind of freed up entirely and other people you know, spend quite a bit more time on it than we currently do. I mean here's the thought most of us are usually here all day Tuesdays. Couldn't we schedule doesn't have to be the same thing as couldn't we schedule a lot of, you know what I mean, on those Tuesdays. I mean, I, I, I personally don't have a problem if you listen to them, listen to them, to listening to all of them. What I have a problem with is listening to all of them, and then when the budget comes around, and about 10, that, that comes back, and they'll have three or four people there. You know, and, you know, I'm not going to mention any, any, any names, but you know, the initials are you know, physically, but anyhow. <laughs> And you know they, the presentation gets you know coming back more and more. I mean I'm, I'm all about whatever this must be. I don't I would want to scare people all of a sudden we're not doing it. They're like, oh gosh, man, you're not invited. But I'm here all day too. So. Well, on the applicant side though, you know you want to you look for any cue from the funder or right. how you can have more opportunity to show your work and maximize the likelihood you're going to get it. So. Everybody, anyone who comes multiple times is being very smart. Uh -huh. Oh, I, well, right. yeah. I so I just mean, but if we were like, if we were being much clearer, like, here's how your grant will be assessed. Here's the timeline. Here's who will assess it. That answers all the questions mm -hmm. that are being asked, and it takes away the sort of if, if we show up at every meeting for three months, does right. that slightly increase yeah. the odds that we'll be funded? Right, but it, but right now I think there's sort of a. That's well, open to interpretation, potentially. Well, in another way, it's like I said, if you're ever Tuesday, we start with this thing in December before. Why don't we split it up? Like, you know, start our meeting early, like at 4 o'clock, just an hour for them in two different sessions. And that way, you know, that's, that's like one month or time. Just split you're saying interview all the groups, do it one hour at a time for before meetings? Mm -hmm. You can take the groups and give them for the amount of time. You know, three minutes, it takes us usually two hours or whatever. You do it anyway and just split it up and two different meetings, bring them in before our meeting actually starts. If we start it early and just listen, a half of one time and half of the next time. That's, you know, it breaks it up at least. I've written down all the ideas um, that we've talked about, and I'm sensitive to the time constraint. Um, well, the, um, and I appreciate that, but also, you know, we kind of take a bite at this, and then we kind of, take, we just, I think 
we're going to make changes and make some decisions about it so we don't have another hour long decision. I think, I mean, here's my sense. The options are um, kind of keep the full board involved in the process, or at least for the group of grants that we're going to review, as opposed to departments taking the lead. Do we, first of all, do we want to continue to do that? I think the other option is to form a subcommittee of the county commission that would work on this and come up with a set of recommendations for the commission, which the commission is absolutely, I would, I would anticipate with a variety of views and perspectives here that there be, they probably won't just, you know, um, I'm always 100% agree with the committee, but that, that would at least be a starting point. So, do people have any kind of leaning towards one or the other? So what, what if you what if you split the list? Uh, I think if we're going to have a committee. That committee needs to be in charge of mm -hmm. reviewing 100 percent of it. So it's not yeah. like you have these people to talk to these groups. Because whoever you talk to, you know, you kind of bond with them. You get you hear the story, yeah. they yeah. cry, or, or not. you know. Or so not. or right. Or, or so I, I don't think you can divide it up. I think whoever's in charge needs to be in charge of reviewing the whole thing. That's right. my experience from staff reviews. Yeah. And we yeah. split it and have different yeah. staff reviewing yeah. different yeah. applications. You're going to favor the ones you oh, yeah. Yeah. But we could film yeah. them all, the presentations to the committee, so anybody, other commission wanted to watch it, could watch it. Um, if they sure. want to see part of it themselves. Because we'd still bring them in to present to the committee. Um, and we meet with them quarterly anyway. But to yeah. the Brownie's point, um, were you saying that so the committee would make recommendations to the commission? Yes. Yeah. And so. Yeah. 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 But if somebody had a burning desire to see them, we could invite oh, yeah, somebody. Yeah. 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 So just straw poll. This is we're not voting on stuff, but this is this is all just process stuff. So, but who who would be more inclined to having a subcommittee? Probably three members of the commission, three or four, or something like that, to kind of review proposals and make uh, make some recommendations to the commission as part of the process. Who would, who would lead in that direction just right now? Me. Okay. Three. Okay, and then who would lead? Oh, Al. Yeah, Al, uh, Ellen, and Jetson. Okay, who would lean more towards not having a committee, you know, whatever process we're using, kind of everyone's just sort of, everyone's involved in Robert, Mike, and Joe and I are kind of on the fence. I'm on so, all right. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so, uh, 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 I would leave for the committee, at least for kind of the smaller projects. I mean, if there's a, uh, you know, if, a, if it's a Lee Walker Heights or something like that, then just shoot them on our agenda and review it. Um, so, so I would kind of be in that category. Uh, so Joe's asking, can we have four people on the committee instead of three? I think we could. Do we know? I would lean towards the I would lean towards the committee if if it if it had four and we uh, you know had I think, so, I think so far I think this this board has been pretty good about the way we've kind of partnered people together. Mm -hmm. Okay. We did four. We were very careful with, uh, with you know, who we put on that board. And uh, I, so th what about I think two, what about I you? think two to my left are pretty, pretty good. Or are you and Jasmine and Alan High? I put Robert on. Okay, there you go. Robert said he wants to hear every proposal. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I would. I would too. Yeah. yeah. Two. Well, okay, with that. Yeah, I, I think it's probably. Yeah. I mean, Mandy brought up something there. I mean, uh, breaking them up and everything. What about? I mean, we all got time when we're at home. You know, well, these people aren't coming to my house. No. no. <laughs> but I have them to do a video. You know, give them a seven-minute video. They video, and then we kind of look at it. They can do the mm. order deal. They can bring everything. We can look at it over. A That's a great idea. That's actually. Weeks. That's a cutting edge of Alan and I would fall asleep. 
That's a really good idea. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Thirty minutes. We can't do what we did about that. Yeah. And <laughs> like that's really not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. All right. We, well, hey, we, we are at our we are about at our time. Uh, so it sounds like there's some significant interest in that idea. Um, and I think there was consensus that a later yeah. application would work, and I think that what we've heard brings us enough to, to bring forward a, a, a staff grade proposal for consideration and discussion. That's, well, if that's we have another one, we should push my little time for this again. That is more concrete than this other thing. And the other, the other things I hear concerns on are that like larger, larger projects, especially if they're not part of this kind of recurring set of groups that we oftentimes work with, they should be scheduled for presentations to the full county commission. Right. They shouldn't be put in this, you yeah, know, kind right. of relatively small pool of right. grant funding. And I think one other question that we have too is like if we do, like I, I mean, I think that there's obviously a lot of interest in doing more well pre-K. Um, so, I, I mean, do we want to just go ahead and say like that's that's a priority for this year? I mean, because it's isn't is that, are we kind of already already there? So, uh, and, and I don't think this is the only place that that can happen. I mean, I think we all coming out of the recommendation. Um, when I bring you back here in the month, and I think that there, if we say it's a priority, I think that's fair to the other, you know. Not that they're not going to get anything, but also if we say it's a priority, maybe they'll gear more things that they have for the good day. Well, and that doesn't mean we're going to approve everything that comes before us. Because we already done, we already did the math on that and figured out we're going to do it, you know. But, well, but it, we can do a lot. Yeah. And there might also be ideas that emerge around pre-K throughout the year mm -hmm. that are separate from this right. process that we might yeah, right. want to slow down to, to, to go through this specific process too. So. Um, so there was a lot of big thing, big asks in the community development grant last time. There's a lot. The BCCM had a big one. The museum had a big one. Uh, you know, the Lee Walker Heights, you know, all, all of those. Now, to me, Lee Walker Heights was, it, it's it's different. You know, they like to go in. It, they needed a lot of, they needed a lot of time. I don't know what a lot is, a lot of time, 10 minutes. They needed Need a lot of time to do that presentation in three minutes was ridiculous. We we visited. You know, there was a lot of there was a lot. It never should have been. It never should have been put where it was. Yeah. Okay. So we're Rachel. What else? Any other things you think we ought to try to? Give me back on the ball. Thank you. Um, we'll go through the notes um, and what we heard.
Still sore.